Hi, I'm Rob from popzine.com. Thank you for joining me live on Google Plus and um, YouTube. It's the fe February edition of what we is currently called um, hops, malts, yeast, and waffle. There's no waffles involved. I mean, there's a, so much hilarity on Facebook yeah. about it. There's no no uh, eat right. Stuart's got some waffles on here, I bet. You know it. <laughs> anyway, so this is a, a regular monthly um, kind of like gathering of YouTube's finest beer reviewers. So let's start at the start with the, the little one, the little one, the baby of the group. Hi, Meadows. How are you doing? The beer guy. Oh, I'm good, thanks. Yep, and I'm enjoying. Cool. Looking forward to another three-hour special talk about beer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, have, I have capped this at three hours as well, so... Good, good. <laughs> You've got to set a limit. I mean, three hours as well, I mean, not three hours. Long enough of anything, as good as it may be. So, um, next up, obviously, everyone's favourite. Uh, resident J David Janella looks like. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the catchphrase. He's got the power of the Welsh. Thank you, man. How are you doing? Hello, everybody. Yeah, um, February's edition. So, uh, what's on the agenda tonight, guys? Talking about beer, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, you've got lots of um, poignant questions to ask everyone. So, we'll get on to the beer in a minute. But next up, um, resident um, Brainiac. Um, <laughs> he's got glasses, clearly. He's a lot more intelligent than the rest of us. Um, he's a professional brewer as well, Jack Walker. Fair beer reviews, how are you doing? Um, spiffing, thank you. Thanks for inviting me once again. Uh, looking forward to some good, good, good talk. Three hours of ramble, I like it. Yeah. Silly nuts and get. See, I'm not working in morning, so I can get as drunk as I want this time. Oh, brilliant, yeah. <laughs> but you had a sore head last um, time. A little bit, yeah. It was that, that, that growler of founders uh, breakfast that was. <laughs> there wasn't much left of it for the following day. So, next up, we, we, not one. Uh, but two, if we can, I don't know if I would cope with these two tonight because I've seen a couple <laughs> of the beers have got lined up, so it may end badly. But for us, a lot more than them, I'd say. Um, Stuart, Andrew, Picard, hey. the combined powers of the Ginger Ale Ale Trail. The Ginger Ale Trail, lads. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we've got um, on the end, last but not least, he's got the most impressive craft beard of the lot of us, um, Adam. From Adam's Craft Beer Channel, channel because he does he does more than just reviews. How are you doing, mate? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Thank you for inviting me once again. How come he got a whoop? Awesome. Nobody else got a whoop. Because he's that cool. That's why he got a whoop. Yeah, well, what can I say? Um, right. So, actually, while we're on Adam, we'll start with you. What are you drinking, mate? Um, what are you drinking now? What, you, what have you enjoyed recently? Um, what am I drinking now? I'm currently drinking the <coughs> new can of Fort Smith by Roosters, and I've also got a bottle of uh, the American Brown Ale by Runaway Brewery. Ah, oh, very nice. Yeah, the um, new one from Manchester. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they they, they do some pretty decent stuff. Um, this is <coughs> the third one that I've tried from their from their range, um, and it's it's pretty decent. Rob actually recommended that one to me. Um. This one's not too bad either. It's the only can that I've tried in the range. Um, and recently, recently I've been drinking a lot of books and stuff. Um, more of their higher ABV experimental sort of stuff at the moment. And that's basically because they're fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't do any wrong. Yeah, I've got to admit, I mean, books, books are doing so much stuff at the moment. It's crazy. It's hard to keep up really? with it all. I mean. I think I've got like three or four, which I haven't had a chance to kind of like touch yet. So out of the ones that you've had, which is really your favourite, if you don't mind, spoiler alert. All, yeah. Um, yeah. I've not had them all yet, actually. I've still got I'm two really left. And, uh, out of the ones that I've had so far, um, the... Oh, gosh. I think the... I enjoyed the red raspberry sour. Quite a lot. Oh, really? Okay. And also really enjoyed um, the collaboration that they did with Total, the collaboration Carnage. And my favourite one that I've had so far 
Um, bearing in mind that I've not had the last two, but the favourite one I've had so far is the English barley wine that they did with Evil Twin. It was absolutely awesome. Cool. If you if you see it, it's called Anglomania. I think it's a ten percent English barley wine. It's absolutely yes, awesome yes, stuff. Mm-hmm. I oh, bear in mind that I had a fresh bottle. It was only two months old, and it still had quite a lot of hop character to it. But it wasn't like an American yeah. barley wine or anything. But oh my god, yeah. it was just awesome. Jack, you should check that one out if you like your barley wines. I know you do, mate. So. Uh, strange enough, I've, I've had it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, had it. What do you had, it for, had it, friends of mine. Yeah, it was um, amazing. Yeah, really yeah. was. Yeah. I had um, yeah. Behemoth by Three Floyds, and, and they were so similar. Um, and that's a oh, really wow. good thing to say, right? About Buxton's kind of yeah. contributions. Yeah, I liked it. Impressive. Uh, next up, um, I, I dread to think. Um, Stuart, Andrew, what are you drinking, and what have you enjoyed recently? So what's that? Stuart calls it a cuckoo brewery off uh, off beat brewery. Uh, it's the Overton Ales Long Sheep Smoked Porter, 4.6%. Uh, very tasty. Uh, first initially uh, smell is like it's off putting. It's like it smells like something off. But once you get you've got it in the glass breathing, it's it's actually really good. Uh, oh, okay. As for the one, keeping it British. <laughs> in a can. <laughs> Just like, we'll be doing a, bit, a few cans tonight. You know, like uh, Adam, Adam uh, with the Fort Smith, we, we had the, their can range, uh, which was the best one out of the three was the, uh, what was it, what was it, the Baby Face. Oh, uh, Baby Face, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 that, was really that, that was really good. Uh, we actually tried as well the uh, black sheep on can as well, okay. uh, which is a difference, a little difference to the bottle, but only slightly. Okay, better or worse? Well, I'd say it's better on can. Okay, all right, fair enough. And um, Stuart, <laughs> Stuart's not saying the thing. <laughs> uh-huh. Stuart, so what? Um, you were giving us a preview of what some of you're currently working on. What is that then? Do you want to share that with the group? He's good at that. Uh, keep it secret. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, okay. Well, keep it secret then. <coughs> I'm just wondering if it's from here else. Cool. Um, so, Jack, what are you working on at the moment, and what's been good? Uh, right, I'll try and cram in loads of stuff as quickly as I can do. So, uh, number one, this little growler here is um, Atom's newest brew. I've literally just tried it right now. It's called the Devil's Bilge Water. Um, it's a smoked chipotle and lemon thyme uh, stout. And I'm actually pleasantly, um, I'm quite happy with it. Yeah, uh, we'll go too much into detail. 6.3, uh, if you see it, give it a try. It's got chili bites to it, so if you like that, cool. Uh, I've also got um, Signature Brews Black Tongue, double IPA, Mastodon. Signature, I love Mastodon, so that's cool. Um, what else was I drinking? Yeah, I had, I had the mother of all sessions on like the rarest sour beers in the entire world um, and just had the, a whale of a time drinking Lupet Creeks and Gerses and Russian River Sours and stuff with a, a mate of mine. Um, I didn't video any of it. I thought, I'm just going to kick my heels up and just yeah. enjoy stuff. Um, but, God, some of these beers have got good reputations and they were just absolutely... Knockout! It's just so depressing. It's like, yeah, nah, I've done it. Yeah. <laughs> and the final thing is, if you will, uh, shameless plug, but it's not. I don't get any money for it. Um, go pick up the Hop and Barley magazine's latest episode. Um, yours truly has reviews in it, uh, written. And I'll, 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 well done, mate. In the next few weeks, I'll I'll post up the kind of the. Uh, it, it, they're all on weird beard beers. I'll have okay. the. Reviews going up online. So I said I wouldn't put them up until the magazine was out and stuff, you know. So, so uh, they go go hand in hand, roughly though. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'm it's doing. A lovely, it's a lovely looking magazine. I bought, I yeah. bought the um, the last one. Yeah, a lovely magazine. Independent and all this business, so well, well worth supporting. Mm-hmm, for sure. And if you didn't need another reason for it, clearly you can read what, <laughs> well, what, um, you what Jeff thinks. Like, some weird beer beers. So Simon, come on, don't keep us waiting any longer. What what? What awesome beers have you got lined up? Been reviewing a degree, obviously. Nice. Um, first one was the West Berkshire Brewery, the Dr. Hexter's Healer Strong West Bitter, or Strong Bitter. Pretty good, you know, classic British style, 5% strong bitter, really malty and bready and biscuity. 
Then went on to the Devil's Backbone Swords Beer in Black Lager, which oh. is pretty good. Pretty good beer. I think they, for Virginia, this, they're the largest brewery in Virginia, Devil's Backbone, I believe. And they're kind of just north of the border from Stone, so there's talk of Stone moving into Virginia, which I'm not sure if you guys have heard it. it might be true, it might be false. Um, and the Thornbridge. Charlie Brown. Now this is the most surprising beer of the night because I had the Terrapin peanut butter port. I thought that was kind of okay, mm, you yeah. know. Then of course the Rogue stuff behind, which was just flavors. It was a bit like Hershey's chocolate, you know, that that kind of artificial taste. But this, this was just. It was like opening a bag of peanuts. It really was. Like, it is. <laughs> we said that. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. You know, I was almost disappointed that I I wasn't crunching peanuts. It was, it was <coughs> a very, very strange experience. And what am I doing? I got a collab, couple of collaborations lined up in the next few months. I'll let you know closer to the dates what what they mm. what, what they what they are what they are. Mm. Oh, he's got his. And you, various Rob, you using you? various pies. <clears throat> oh, well, I'll get on to Harry before I tell you what I'm. Oh, of course. Uh, what I'm drinking at the moment. So, uh, so Harry, what's in your glass and what have you drunk recently? What's been good? Um, what I've got at the moment, I've got this original land beer. If anyone's heard of this, uh, but I bought it from my local bottle shop. I've got two bottles of this along with a freestyle. It seemed like a good deal. Um, and then, so I've got that coming up. It's okay. I'm not overly sure about it at the moment. But the next one I've got, um, I don't know if anyone's had, from Hotel Chocolat of all places, um, is, is was it their cocoa beer. Okay. Um, it's acceptable, I'd say. It, it's all right. It's, it's nice and it's very lactic, um, quite smooth. And um, it's, I, I'd compare it to, I think I compared it to uh, Saltaire's Triple Choc. I think that was probably the most similar one. Mm -hmm. um, but what so who brewed that? Um, I'm Does not really sure. I think Brew Shed. Brew Shed? No. I, I thought at first, um, because it's round the corner from Green King, it's a, ex almost ah. exactly the same uh, postcode as Green King for oh. what I when I reviewed it. So I don't know whether it is the same. Mm. Um, but what have I got coming up after this? I'm, I'm currently going through the XT Brewing range, if anyone's heard of them. Mm. Um, yep, yep. They do their numbering system. So I'm just working through them of what I can get. Um, I've done one, th I, I had two of their first two beers. I was a little bit disappointed by one and three. I moved on to six, and then now I've got nine left and various of their other named ones, mm -hmm. which I'm just going through their range. Um, but other than that, I'm looking forward to a couple of little... Um, much like this, Google Plus reviews with a couple uh, J Terrio next week uh, with uh, with Ginge as well, and then possibly another one as well midweek. I've never seen Stuart so quiet. It was mental. <laughs> it's, it's slightly unsettling, uh, but let's enjoy it while we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> see, Damien, did you just have a dance? Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, um, I've, just, I've just done a couple of videos before and we came on, so I've got like stuff in glasses. Um, so, there are cans. What I'm drinking at the moment is um, Weird Beards, a faceless spreadsheet ninja. And Simon did a review of this recently. Hey, Peter. So, this is. Oh! Like, using like an, oh, Peter's here! Yay! Yay! Hey, <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, uh, first time uh, uh, Weird Beard have canned uh, uh, anything, we've got. Um, it's, it's on one of these mobile bottling plants. I mean, it, if I were going to start up a, a business at the moment, it'd be, I mean, it'd be a mobile so canning kind of plant because everybody's doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit. Uh, it's, a bit it's, it's just not that hoppy. As a bit of a random aside, we, we just costed up doing mobile canning through the same company uh, that, that we be do it through. Um, I'll say it, that they're so much cheaper than getting bottling done in our backyard by one of the bigger guys in the area. It's crazy how cheap it's going, so we're seriously considering doing the same thing because cans are better for beer. That's a debate for later. Um, but it's cheaper than getting our stuff bottled out of house, so uh, we're thinking of doing the same thing, oddly. 
Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it seems a little bit um, uncarbonated for me. That? I mean, I was, and, and and when I open when I opened the can, it kind of started ripping off the ring pole, so I had to like get my bottle open and stab it through. So not ideal. Uh, next one was um, uh, Oats Brewery in Halifax, their APA American Pale Ale. Um, Six point eleven percent ABV, which is I'm ne- I don't think I've ever had a beer that's six point eleven. Eleven. I thought it like did it stop? I thought it stopped at twelve, but it, I mean it stopped at yeah. ten. Six point eleven. Yeah. That's Halifax um, for you though, isn't it? Uh, well, I think that explains a lot. It's all right. Yeah. I think the, the, the brewer sent me um, um, me a batch of. And he said he did prefer the dry hopping to be a bit more. Um, and to be honest, I think it could do with that. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's decent. Sweet on the sweeter side of the things. But then the the big one, which um, I've currently got, now got nine cans of, um, is um, Beaver Town's Bloody Hell, which, uh, which is their Blood Orange IPA. Um, first time round, it was it, just in bottles. Were I thought it was a bit of a mess. It was a bit muddy and a bit near. But this time it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's just it's, it's just so good. I mean, um, oh, it's so it's in stupid demand at the moment. Try it next week. I can't wait. I've, I've got a couple of cans of it at my parents' house, so I just can't wait to get into that. It, it, it's really good. I mean, it, it, it's, it's best IPA I've had from Bootsy. Because I don't. I guess I was saying in my video, they, they haven't really got an IPA. I, mean, I guess uh, Eight Ball is their strongest. Kind of hoppy beer, and that's a rye IPA. So um, I find it quite odd that yeah. there are only specials where their IPAs are specials, like the Bone King, and then and now this. I mean, it's, but anyway, it's incredible. I mean, it's in massive demand, and it's it's well worth all the hype. Um, anyway, um, as he's he, he has now arrived, the our guest of honour. All, all the way from <laughs> Peter, the master of hobbits. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Pretty good. Drinking some uh, English beer or London beer. Mm, Old Cornish one stuff. It's really good. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's nice stuff. Though. Probably yeah. one of the best export stouts I ever had. I think. Wow. And it's probably not quite. I don't know how fresh it is, but I remember having it, and it's quite hoppy when I've had it. Oh yeah. It, I had it on tap at a tap takeover with newer English breweries or UK breweries, and it was on tap, and it was much fresher than this bottle. But I remember it as being hoppier as well. But really good oh, stuff. Cool. Yeah, it is very nice. So, um, so you're drinking on that at the moment. Um, what have you had recently? What's what's been good? Uh, well, this Tuesday I had bourbon barrel aged Norwal from Sierra Nevada, and that was freaking wow. amazing. <laughs> And I had uh, bourbon barrel aged smoking wood. I had this one. One second. This one by Westbrook, their fourth anniversary Imperial Stout, which is made with chocolate, coconut, and almonds. Oh, that sounds good. We just get, got a huge selection of uh, of Westbrook beers locally. Cool. I'm a big fan. Of Westbrook do some great stuff. Oh yeah, so that was that was really fun to try. Yeah, and I, I I was trying to get some information out of the I bumped into the actually when at the launch of Bloody Hell at North Bar in Leeds. Um, I was trying to I was talking to the distributor who brings in Sierra Nevada to the UK. I was trying to see if he would bring over the bourbon barrel is now well and Duffy Cues, which is disappointing. Mm. I heard some alarming news that we might not be getting um, uh, Bigfoot this year. Which is the first time oh. in a long time. It's big for some of the few beers that I that, that I um, that I actively kind of are developing a, a, a vertical of because it's when it first came out when I first started buying it it was like two fifty a, a bottle and now it's like up to about four fifty a bottle so it's not quite as um, so, uh, as economic but you know what I mean it's, it's good stuff but it just seemed like this will always turn up it's not a bad price I, I know it aged really nicely so. I think I've got like five years of a vertical, but I mean, it's an old beer. It's now. It's like yeah, a, it is. It's like a benchmark American style barley wine. Yeah, I mean, when it's fresh, it's, it's really hoppy. I mean, it's, yeah. it's great stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'll be interested to see. I've, I've had, I think, I've had like a, 
a year old run at a tasting um, one of the guys from Sierra Nevada did in Leeds a number of years ago but uh, and that was good but you I mean I don't know what like a like a five plus year old bottle will taste like should be interesting what's yeah. the oldest one you've got Rob? pardon what's the oldest one you've got ooh I'd have to look 2008 maybe wow I bet that yeah, tastes great yeah, well, I've got two of each. So, I mean, I've got. I've, I've, I don't know when I'll do it. I mean, it's one of those the kind of um, habits of the beer you know, developing a range of, of a vertical tasting for some point in the future. I don't know when, but I mean, I'll get around to it. Uh, another feeling. I've got so many beers in my cellar. I've got big 750 mil bottles of strong stuff, and I'm like. Thing is, if I crack the open level of glass, I'd be like, I can't drink anymore. I'll get so drunk. So <laughs> it's just a matter of like finding people who's willing to come over and go. I'm just gonna go review this and come and bring it out to you, so you can have some. Is that all right? <laughs> Without feeling too dickish about it, really. Uh, well, you should. Therefore, you should come to my next um, my, my next bottle share, which is over in which I'm starting in Leeds. Um, first one's in at the back end of March. Mm. It's a paid event. I mean, I've kind of. T- I've been thinking about it for a while, and obviously, those guys have had a, c- a couple of bottle shares, and it's always been fun. And this guy called Matt Curtis, who's a really kind of highly thought of um, t- um, beer writer in the UK, and he does one in London. It's ten places, ten pound a ticket, and then the hundred pound made from the ticket sales, uh, we spend that on the beer that we we drink in the night. So there's no profit in it or anything. It's just, and then you can bring bottles along as well if you want, um, but it's just. <coughs> yeah. Ten people keeps it manageable, and then hopefully I can source some kind of semi-interesting things for us to to try. But yeah, I mean, if you ever want to come along, oh yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is, I mean, I don't know if, who's going to watch this, but you know, I've kind of hinted it on um, online for for May because I'm going to Copenhagen in May, and I, I found out that. Um, mm-hmm. um, um, War pigs do growler fills, so I'm gonna try and plan my bottle really? share quite, are, quite are soon after. CBC? No, no, it's it's at the back end of uh, kind of like last week in May or something. Yeah, nah. Cut, cut, you get CBC. Cut, cut you you should go to uh, the Danish Beer Enthusiast Festival. It's yes, gonna be yeah, a planter. Better. It's gonna be better this year than last year because this year. Uh, a lot of cooler breweries are going to be like coming to the festival as well, uh, and I think McKellar is actually joining himself for the first time in a long time. Yeah, I know it's on. Um, I think it's like my like Facebook page. It's my, um, Thomas um, Shona. Shona. Yeah, Thomas Shona. Mikkel's, Mikkel's kind of um, right hand man, and he um, he's like saying he's going. So yeah. cool. But, yeah. Well, Thomas Shona is actually not with McKellar anymore. He started his Ooh. own brewery. Yeah, ah. I don't know if you heard it, but that was a big thing about it. And then um, he decided to go his own ways and uh, started up Rocket Brewing Company. Rocket? Yeah. All oh, right, okay, cool. Have you had anything from him? Nope. It's All right, been cool. so high demand. It's been impossible to find. But I've heard <laughs> very big things about it. Uh, apparently, he okay. brewed the beers at, at Borefts, if you know that festival that one oh, yeah. has. Yeah. And um, uh, ever since that, it's been very hard to find it. But I've heard very mixed opinions on it. Okay. I just saw it today. Oh yeah, go so go. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna mention that Adam, but yeah, go for it. All oh, right. Oh yeah. Okay. Go go for it. No, no, I was I was going to say something else, but I was going to mention that later. Anyway, what I was saying is, I never really got my head around what uh, Thomas's kind of role was. He kind of seemed more of like a like a like a like a marketing figure, really. I mean, he was uh, what in Danish we call Altmuliman, basically a guy who does everything. So he brews, he does marketing, he was just doing all kinds of things with the brewery. Just a kind of like a, a and, and very much a quite outlandish personality, I guess. He did a lot of a, oh, yeah. a lot of videos and stuff, didn't he? Yeah, he was he's a uh, pretty cool guy. I've met him a few times. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he sent me um he sent me some uh, bottles of coffee when it first came out. Oh, I yeah, uh, on YouTube. The coffee IPA, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, first time round, I mean, I couldn't believe it. Look, I, I just I said, <clears throat> anyway, is this coming over to the UK? And he said, well, well, give me your address. I'll uh, I'll send you some. All right then. 
cool. <laughs> That's made up. Uh, but yes, as Adam was going to say, I think um, I guess one of the big stories at the moment, um, Nicola is kind of buying. I, don't, I can't really. I don't know the exact facts of it, but essentially, Nicola has bought the old, or in the process of buying the old Alesmith Brewery, which kind of saddens me away because I've been there. I think, oh man. Well, the thing is, Alesmith is moving to another facility. Yes. Much bigger, yeah. I mean, massive, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And just so small. Oh yeah, it's tiny. It's super tiny. But uh, the beer that the Keller did with Ale Smith called uh, Beer Geek Speedway yeah. was oh. actually a test on the <coughs> on the old systems. Ah, right. Interesting. So uh, he is going to start McKellar San Diego, and uh, the plan with the brewery, as far as I could find out, was uh, doing lots of collaboration beers with uh, Californian breweries, but also release collaboration beers with Ale Smith, and then also have a base in the U.S., so the U.S. can also get fresh McKellar beer. Okay. All oh, right. I guess a lot of American Americans do kind of complain that they the price of Mikkeler beer, so uh, yeah. I bring them down. A lot, I know a lot of people who they hate Mikkeler because they get bottles and then they're old and all this stuff. But yeah, everyone's got an opinion on him. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely divisive, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Uh, with I've got uh, one of the videos coming up on my channel will be um, going to the Whale Smith, um, and as you say, it's such a tiny little place, and uh, they had like plans for the new place on, on the wall, uh, not that I don't think I got to video it, but the new place, the size of it, the sheer scale of it, was just absolutely immense, and it was so hard to believe they were already producing so much on such a tiny kit. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I like Ale Smith a lot, I think all the beers are really solid, uh, if not fantastic, so mm-hmm. I think that would be quite interesting, and Mikula taking the old kit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the man, the man will try and take over the world, I suppose. Uh, and who's to blame him, you know? Well, I think this week he's opening a bar in uh, Reykjavik as well. <laughs> yeah. What's the news with um, Cigar City being bought up by... Anheuser. Anheuser bought it. It was a rumour, wasn't it? I don't think it's a... Yeah. Rumour, is that... I just think it's a rumour. I saw a picture online, I don't know if it was fake, but it was the entrance to Cigar City and there was a smack a big and I was a bush, bush A on the glass doors. I think it was fake. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> and, and I saw people posting uh, Photoshop pictures of their, they have a beer called Bud Light Limerita, which is like a mix of uh, margarita and beer and Bud Light Lime. Then they made uh, a fake Bud Light Huna Rita, so Huna <laughs> Huna <laughs> Margaret, uh, <laughs> right. yeah. but I don't, think, cool. I don't, I don't think it happened. Yeah, just some some beer geeks with too much time on their hands <laughs> trying to upset people. Just a bunch of trolls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of trolls, Stu, what are you up to? Nothing. I saw, I saw, I saw you, you were you were flashing a Budweiser can just there. I'm 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 kind of hoping <laughs> that you're not going to go all Simon on us and. Strip bare chested and rub it into your, <laughs> rub it into your armpits. Yeah, I love that, man. We should. We should. No, the best thing about this is because we realised you were something. I reckon, I reckon next one of these we do, we should all start off just bare chested, pouring cans of Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have seen more of that, all Simon like that. Yeah, I mean, that what it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was the best bit I've ever seen, Simon. You know what I mean? Oh, hey. oh go, look at this. Go on, do you want to give me a tenner the next time I see you? <laughs> you get the can as well. <laughs> You will drink, you will enjoy it. I don't know what's going on, to be honest. No, it's <laughs> lagging a little bit. No, I think they're just mental. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the funny thing, I wanted to, um, while Peter's here, I wanted to say, um, I was thinking this, I was in the kitchen making breakfast, I was thinking about the video, and Peter sent me a message. Have you seen the Budweiser Super Bowl ad? And I was like, Yeah, I'm in the process of working something out. And uh, I'm just, I'm just waiting for you guys to kind of get on with it and do. And do it <laughs> well, I think Andrew and she should definitely do something. 
Well, us are just chest and go like that. <laughs> it's all the hard work. Mm. Is that what you doing? What are you doing? It's all the hard work. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Rude the hard way. Sorry. I'm going to get a long time with that old crappy video. <laughs> Mm. Apparently, they pulled the the review of uh, or the review the the, yeah, the, the yeah, commercial. Yeah. Because they got into like an internet shitstorm. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, well, it's like, yeah. what was the point really? What was the point of it all? I mean, they were they were kind of well, like it was completely contradictory, it, it, wasn't it? It was just like. <laughs> Did anyone see the um, the one with the the horses in the supermarket and the guy's about to buy some craft beer and the horse kind of. Moves another couple of steps forward and nudges him towards the Budweiser, and he, and he ends up going, "Oh, okay, I'll have a pack of Budweiser instead." Anybody seen that video? No, no, no. That was just as bad. <laughs> and that whole that whole lost dog thing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. With the dog whole, running home. And, yeah. We're we're all lost dogs, aren't we? That's what they're saying. We're we're being chased by the wolves that are craft beer. It's dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Wow. The hot flavour in that. Oh man. <laughs> it's that Beachwood <laughs> agent. It's that Beachwood agent that's done it all. That Beachwood agent. Beachwood agent. I reckon I reckon we should move on from that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the captain with that? <laughs> yeah, very good. Anyway, so yeah. So, well, as we were talking about earlier, cans, I mean, I've been thinking about this all. I mean, as Jack say, um, after we're going to um, start doing a bit of canning, um, for me, and, and because of the, the, the beers that I've got in front of me, I mean, Weird Beard and um, Beaver and they kind of, kind of seem like <coughs> suitable breweries to, um, to be canning beers, because I guess traditionally canned can beers are, as Stuart and Andrew were saying, I mean, black sheep, Fuller's London Pride, the bigger kind of like beers, and I think that that's one kind of side of it. But then this new kind of wave of the smaller can is definitely the kind of more progressive craft brewery. But then I mean, obviously Roosters did some, and that, when I first heard about that, I were a bit like, well, I didn't really expect that because I see them as quite a traditional brewery. And then like now I've got the got, got that stuff from Oat, <laughs> very much a, a Cascale brewery. Uh, I didn't really expect that. Do you think? There is. Sh- should does it work for certain breweries? I mean, it's like um, something like Timothy Taylor's landlord. I mean, should that be in a can? Should mm. have like stuff from That'd more? Nice. Sh- should should should, should, can, should, can, should cans be the kind of realm of um, the kind of more modern breweries? Because does it does it more suit the style of beer that you find in like IPAs, stouts, whatever, opposed yeah, yeah. to kind of more traditional stuff? Well, I think on this whole idea of canning, the more people use it, the more equipment we get produced to make canning more viable. And then the price of that equipment comes down, the price of canning comes down, and everybody starts to can. At the moment, I think, um, I know Barry Island IPA, it was, we, we were in deep discussions about putting it in can. Cool. But in the end... Dustbin yeah. can. Yeah. It, 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 it went from um, not not being in can because I think they had to produce like a quarter of a million cans to make it viable, and they just two thousand uh, the minimum. Minimum you can order cans for. Yeah, they didn't really want to commit to that level of well that volume really. Um, which, which I thought mm, it, it, they, they should have gone with it because it was before all this Beaver Town and everybody else was starting putting beer in cans. I took um, cans of Six Point Bengali Tiger, which was sent to me from Six Point into Brains, and I said, "Look, this this is the future. This is going to work." But then again, talking about that quarter of a million span of, of, of production. The more people who can, the more people bring out new kind of canning machines, and the cheaper it comes, and then you haven't got to produce so much of it. I think, yeah, yeah. I always, um, from 
watching what uh, American breweries who have kind of dedicated to canning. I mean, I remember seeing there's a one in Texas. I can't remember what it's called. And um, I mean, just the sheer volume you've got to buy. I mean, just as as your kind of like core packaging product is is absolutely staggering. Even like over there. So I don't know. I mean, over here when you've got this mobile canning unit. I mean, how many did you say? Jack? More than a million. Is that right, Jack? No, uh, five hundred thousand. Yeah, well, half a million, half a million cans of whatever. That's, that's, I mean, that's a commitment, and one of the big things with the cans, you've got to put, you've got to find somewhere for them all. Yeah. I mean, um, it's like uh, uh, Brewdog. I mean, they've got a massive site now, so they can, they, they've got the space for it. I know when when Beantown moved to the new brewery, I mean, a lot of that space is taken up with like cans piled high. Same goes for Four Pure. They've got a bigger unit, much bigger than um, the other Bermondsey breweries. But I mean, it's a, it's a big commitment. But you I mean do, do you need breweries like like Beaver Town and like uh, like Brewed Over Gas who will the the kind of forerunners on the kind of like canning in the UK especially? I don't know what's really going in Denmark. I mean, I know Mickle have done some, but that was been at Fly, Sly Fox. But do you, does it need to be those kind of like cool breweries? Those kind of more kind of forward thinking, yeah, what kind of like lead the way, and then yeah. other ones kind of follow behind. And I guess my point is, should they? I mean, should a, a smaller brewery with a, a, a quite a niche appeal, should they go into canning? Because it is a big commitment. And well, I, is, I, think, I think canning is... Uh, I, I think for, for beer, just in general, uh, pros and cons of cans, um, well, to be honest, it's all pros in my in my opinion. Um, yeah. They're completely light sealed. Um, there's no light stri striking. There's no loss of hot flavor from that. No skunking, in theory. Um, bottle caps as well, bottle caps such as these ones, um, they're not completely, oops, hold it up, there we go, there's a the camera, um, not completely sealed, as uh, strange as it sounds, it relies on pressure underneath the cap, uh, there's a little rubber seal, which is called an oxygen trap, it relies on the pressure from CO2 to, to seal it up, so actually for a small amount of time there's leakage, and there's oxidation, and there's lots of flavour, so in terms of pure beer, um, Cans are, will always be better. That, that's just a general rule of thumb, and they can be pressured exactly the same as a bottle. They can be undercarbed, overcarbed, nitro, nitroed up, just the same as anything else. Um, I think it's t two massive considerations come in: is, is uh, style and economics. So we've already said about economics. It's a lot of money to get into canning. To buy a canning range is extortionate, absolutely beyond the wit of anything you'd ever afford as a small brewer in England, at least. Um, and then the, the quantity of cans you have to buy in. <coughs> in reality, 500,000 cans, if you're doing something like your standard pale ale in it, actually, yeah, it's an investment, but so what? You're going to make X amount of your, your pale ale over the course of your brewery's life. Um, this mobile canning guys, they, they all actually, uh, they've got pre-coloured cans that they'll then etch and engrave with your, with your um, patterns on. So if you, if, uh, Rob, if you've got that kind of craft, that, uh, Weird beard, Pit Pilsner. Yeah. Uh, you'll see it's black uh, around the centre yeah. band. They've got no, loads of different. It's a label. It's a label. That. Oh, is that on a label? Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, there you go then. So they they've got silver bullet cans being labelled. So it costs again probably not as much. Um, but the other one's style. No, uh, also working part time in a, in <laughs> to actually pay the bills. Working part time in a micro pub. Uh, cans have just got such a bad rep when it comes to more traditional generations in in terms of English beer. You, it does get like more association with Boddington's cans of crap Boddington's yeah. on the supermarket shelf. They does anything else. So, um, you know, I think quite a few. More traditional breweries will stick to doing bottles, which is like you said when Roosters did cans, it was like, whoa, they are going left of field with that. Although yeah. they've done, they have done the more American craft, sorry, more American style beers in yeah. those cans. Um, so it kind of suits the style, I guess, suits the the people that are probably aiming those beers towards. People like a little bit more exactly. punch, a little bit more bitterness, a little bit of this and that. You know, not so much balance, I suppose. So um, I think you'll see more of the craftier guys going towards cans because do you know what? You put a double IPA in a bottle, and in a couple of months' time, it's just nada. You put it in a can, it's probably got an extra two months on top of that, maybe six months at a push. You know, it's it works mm -hmm. better because. It's just so, it'd be so disheartening to put a bottle. I mean, it happened with my Bear Double IPA I did with Brass Castle. Uh, you still see occasional bottles lying here and there. And to be honest, it's a barley wine now. It's not a, it's not a, a hot monster. Uh, definitely not a hot monster now. So, um, you know, that's that's the problems uh, when it comes to beer. Sometimes they don't sell. 
Uh, so there you go. I suppose that's my two cents. Peter, um, be, I'd be interested to hear about canning in Denmark. Is it is it a thing? We have no craft breweries who can here at all. Um, there is a line of craft beer called Ulfabrecken, which means the beer factory. But the thing is, it's not a craft brewery anymore. It was the, one of the first craft breweries in Denmark, but it was bought up by a bigger Danish brewery called Habu. And when Habu bought them up, they simplified the recipes and uh, decided only to uh, keep their uh, pale ale and pilsner, which they then simplified, and then also um, was it yeah do one or two seasonals, and they're canned. But it's not really craft beer anymore. Well, that's the only canned craft beer here. Other than that, it's Carlsberg the cans and uh, Habo and uh, Royal Unibrew, so the big breweries. But it would be cool to see someone here start something with cans. But who knows? There's there's opening a lot of new breweries here, so it's uh who knows? I mean, there's a new brewery opening on Von Hutten which is an island, and it's uh, the guy behind beer here who's opening a brewery, uh, which is, I think it's going to be focusing on wild beers and sours and stuff, because he bought, like, a shit ton of burgundy red wine barrels and stuff. And then I don't know if they're going to do canning. I don't know yet. It's brand new. And then there's a couple other new ones, like Spy Brew and uh, Dry and Bitter Brewing is a new one coming up, but I don't know. So far, it's like newer breweries, they do bottles because it's cheapest. Cool. In terms of the actual beer, though, I mean, I, I initially thought that when um, Beaver Town, for example, when they started canning, I initially thought that the purpose behind it was to keep the hops fresh. And then all of a sudden, um, they decided to put a stout in a can. And when I had it, I... I didn't really know what the benefit of having it in a can over a bottle was, but then obviously um, when I've tried Gamma Ray in a bottle, I reviewed it in a bottle, and then when I tried it in a can, it was like a completely different beer. It was unreal. So obviously I, I literally thought that the purpose of canning was just to preserve the hops, um, but I mean, I'm no brewer, so I don't know. In general, it preserves the beer better because there is nothing going into the beer, light oxygen, nothing. It's completely in a sealed yeah, container. Yeah. So, <laughs> ironically, so you, you might be right. Also, you might be right, actually. If you get a big bad imperial stout, and sometimes when you age them, you want that little bit of oxygenation, you want a bit of that resource flavor to come through after five years. Those barley wines, those big foot barley wines, are going to get some oxidation yeah. flavors, which are quite actually sought after. So, a stout in a can. Yeah, okay, I, I see that. But also at the same time, I mean, I'm going into like, if as a brewer myself, I suppose, if I put something, I, if I call it a finished product, it's a finished product, and that's the way I'd kind of like it to be served. Um, Stones enjoy after stuff they just brought. The Brit IPAs is probably the first example of a true kind of beer where they've gone, this beer isn't ready, and you're going to have to wait for it. And it's quite, it's kind of like, oh, I've got a bottle downstairs, and it's not ready until Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Um, oh, man. So, you know, yeah, exactly. It's like, I want it. But, um, yeah, if I release a product, it's got to be ready to drink on the spot. So we need to put, a, put out something like a big stout. Um, yeah, I guess it's when you're happy with it, when you when you can do it. So it should be. If you're expecting people to wait, then what about those people who pick it up and drink it and go, whoa, that's just way over the top. It's not smooth yeah. now. So, yeah, okay, I kind of get that. But then no one's saying you have to only do cans or have to only do bottles, you know. Yeah, true. I mean, it's <laughs> still do both, for example. But, I mean, I, I could never see the Belgians doing it. Um, I mean, you know, sour beers are meant to be in green bottles, for example. You know, <laughs> some most cities aren't in green bottles for the purpose of what it's supposed to taste like. You know, if it does get a little bit of light struck, well, that's no big deal because it's a saison. You know, that sort of thing, I guess. And also, um, the most important thing is, if you put a sour in, in a can uh, and it hasn't got a champagne cork in it, that thing will explode and literally become a grenade, and that is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> that would be cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I just wanted to add, whilst we're on the subject of ageing, um, not specifically with cans, um, what would be the maximum age you'd say? Because I've found a box, a crate of Guinness 
at my family home in Ireland, which is 50 years old. Which is quite <laughs> <very good. laughs> Sell it as an antique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could probably earn like a lot of <laughs> yeah. acid selling it. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be looking at drinking it myself or just give it to this poison to someone else. But um, <laughs> what would be the maximum you'd say for, I don't know, example of a, I don't know, a Westie, for example, I, I brought it up last last week, uh, last, last time we did it, West Lutheran, what would be the maximum you'd age it for? I don't know. There are so many opinions, different opinions on aging. I am horrible at aging my beer because I end up drinking it all the time. <laughs> like I, I stick it in. I really, literally need to like go into the woods and dig a hole and make a mark for where I hit the beer or something like that because I'll drink it if it's sitting around. I'll drink it. But I really think it depends on the person and what flavors you you like and stuff. Because to me, uh, aging can go both ways. If you age for a long time, it can mellow out a lot of nice flavors. Uh, if you age for a long time, it could bring out like new oxidized flavors. It really depends on the person. Like for me, for example, uh, smoked beers. I hate aging them because uh, smoke when you age a beer. For example, I tried like different vintages of uh, Alaskan smoked porter. The smoke goes like this, so it'll come like back in waves. So you sit with one vintage, and it's smoke beers are usually not thick and rich. Then it's all of a sudden like a thin kind of light smoky porter, but when you have it fresh, it's just like all up in your face with super intense smoky, meaty flavors. So I really think it depends on the beer and what you're into beer-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you taste the beer and you're like, oh, this is kind of boozy, and then you have more bottles of it, yeah, then I'd age it mm. if I could because <laughs> I end up drinking it anyways, but then I'd age it because the booze will drop down a little with, it, with time. But for me, I'm not – super into aging stuff, mainly because I suck at it, and then also because I'm a little more for breweries releasing beers that are actually ready to be consumed yeah. and not needing yeah, to be definitely. aged for a while, because yeah. I think it sucks when you buy a beer and you say, oh, this sounds awesome, and you drink it, and it's like super boozy and hot, it's like, yeah, definitely. this definitely. two years in my cellar. That sucks. That's exactly what I was trying. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah, I, I, personally, <laughs> that's what I do. If you release a beer, I think you should be ready to drink on the spot. If you if you get multiple of one one sort of beer, then 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 that's great for for, for aging. But uh, if you get a beer and it's rare and you hold on to it for a few years, how are you ever going to know what it actually tastes like? You know, so if you've only got one bottle of beer, drink it when you have it, or you'll never know yeah. what it tastes like. What's the point? So you get a bottle of Hoonapoo and you've ruined it. You've ruined Hoonapoo. You know? Yeah. Agreed. It's like, How it's good just good. a beer. Drink it. <laughs> Some people go too crazy about aging. Like, oh, you can't drink that. It's like, it's just a beer. Drink it whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. except, except if it's, it's, it's Jones and Joy after, in which case, do age it. Otherwise, it will be. Yeah. yeah. See, I, I, I guess I've got two kind of like, um, stuff like that. So I've got um, the full set of Sierra Nevada 30th anniversary beers which came out maybe a good four or five years ago now. I, I mean, I, I've never opened them. I mean, I, I had to buy them because they looked really cool and they were limited number to get in the area, so I, I picked them all up. I've got the full range. But um, at that point, they were like, I, I was struggling to find opportunities to open them. So it felt like it should be like an opportunity. Like, uh, like It's like when me and Stu and Andrew and Adam and um, other friends have got, got together in my kitchen. I mean, it, it feels right to share stuff then. I mean, it's like when we open like Parabola and stuff like that. It feels it feels right to do that, but it doesn't feel right to like. Okay, I'll just have the Heller's Bock or the Black Barley Wine. You don't just on like a Friday night or something. That just never felt right for me. So I guess I've just held on to them like oh, indefinitely, yeah. just just for that right moment. And I don't. I don't oh, cool. Pardon. Oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but exactly. I mean, as silly as that is, I mean, you, Stuart, you probably well, you, you would do. But I mean, it was more fun for us, like four of us, um, to to open a share a can of Fall Oka and just enjoy other people's reaction to that than you just been yeah. at home on your own on a Sunday afternoon, quaffing a can of Fall Oka. I mean, it's it's just not fun. <laughs> but, but the other side of it, the, my point is. Uh, a while back, I bought um, some um, pair of the dog beers on uh, a now defunct um, um, 
shop based in, in um, Amsterdam. Um, I mean, I'd never seen a hair dog before, you know, they're really good things. I bought them, and they weren't quite at the point where Alan Sprint says, he says usually at four years. And I started opening them, I think, last year, maybe year before, and um, because they were, they were kind of hit, like, four or five years. So I opened them up, but I never really knew what they were like fresh. So I think I've still got one or two of them. <laughs> and and um, also there's the... Um, I, I got sent some for about, about my Kevin... Uh, Kevin Finance from Fun's Homebrew, and he, he was like, "Drink, you can drink this one now, but like Adam Cherry from the Woods, don't don't drink for like four years." So we're kind of like, "Well, thanks for sending me it, <laughs> but I might have been doing this channel by the time you, you I like get get round to when tasting it." So I mean, it's a funny situation. It, you know, it, it does. It, Hair and Dog are very much one of the, the culprits for creating beer that has, is supposed to be. Aged like you buy it and then you're not supposed to drink it for four years. What's the? You know, not that, I mean, you shouldn't be forced to wait. You can wait if you choose to wait. And that's your decision. But I think one like buying a lump of cheese and then saying, "Oh yeah, I'm not going to have that sandwich for three years." <laughs> I think a brewery who did that well was Revelation Cat in Italy. They did their Black Knight Imperial Stout back in 2011, and then they aged it for aged it for a year before they released it. So just that it, if they thought I don't know why they aged it, but they did that just in their uh, bottles, and then they just release them once in a while, like a black batch, so people can try them age instead of like releasing all at once and then like uh, eh, age it for your, yourself. I think that's kind of a cool way to do it. Mm. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen yeah, some places. Lambics, I guess, isn't it? Lambics are held onto by the brewery for a number of years until they, until they're ready. Yeah, three years, two years, and one year blended together. Um, yeah, yeah it, and that's the sort of thing. Yeah, I've seen. Um, oh, do you know? I can't remember the name of the brewery off the top of my head, but they released. Um, one of their beers, and then with expected flavours over a course of years. I think it's gigantic from Portland, Oregon, actually, now I would say. Um, their Imperial Russian Stout with a cricket on the front of it, um, saying what expect, what flavours to roughly expect as it, as it ages a bit, and that was that's pretty cool. Now, that's the sort of thing where you go, right, so after four years, it's going to taste like soy sauce in a bottle. Maybe I won't wait four years. I thought that was quite interesting, just from, from previous experiences of what's happened with their other Imperial Stouts. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to have that. I'm just going to close it off. We lost you there, Ben. Oh, it's all right, you're back. Uh, <laughs> so, Harry, what, um, besides the um, um, the the 50 year old <laughs> case of Guinness, is it something you, you're like thinking of like starting to do? You, you're picking out beers that you think, oh, I'd be interested to see what this is like with a couple of years on it and yep. stuff like that, or is it just. If, if the curiosity of the it's like it's like Terry K has opened some really old beers and personally I'm a bit scared of it because I I <coughs> wanted a taste of um, I think it was a is it a Prince a King Charles kind of ale which is like 80 years old or something maybe older and when when we, we, somebody brought it to a bottle share uh, I mean the, the tried to pull the cork out and the cork was completely Knackered, it just shredded the car, and it, uh, and we all got a titchy little bit poured out of this through the, this manky hole in this really <laughs> ancient car, and I, I, can, I blame that. I blame that for me kind of barely being able to walk back to the train station and and, and tripping my guts up when I got home. But I mean, I mean, at a certain point, I mean, does it, does, does it like jump the shark? Or, I think I kind of find, found aging beers by accident because I was just buying so many beers and I was just finding that they would just I'd forget about something and it would be chucked to the back of the fridge. Um, I, like or now as it's spilled over everywhere. I've got like loads of bottles of Delirium which I haven't drunk yet. I, I had it when I was out in Hong Kong and it was, was not the climate to be drinking Delirium Tremont at all. Um, <laughs> So I had, I've got a bottle of Delirium Tremont. I've got their Christmas one, which I'm going to save for next Christmas. It just seems doesn't seem right to be drinking it now. Um, I've also got Bushton Wheats. Um, oh. I haven't so I haven't tried that, but I'm just aging that. Um, is, that got, the, 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 is that the big bottle? The, big bottle, yeah. That's that's the, yeah. It's kind of is it aged in that burgundy barrel or something? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I've had that. That's good. That's good beer. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I got that last. Yeah. 
last uh, probably March or something, so it's coming up a year old anyway. Um, then I've, I've got two bottles of Westie, one's aging and one which I've got ready to try for whenever. Um, and there's another one. Um, can't remember the, I can't remember the brewery now. It's 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 in a um, it's an American brewery, but it's with chicken feather or feathers on on the bottle. I can't remember. Oh, against the grain. Against the grain isn't it? Oh, um, so I've got that to try. Can turkey ride with chicken. But no, I, I wasn't really looking into it too much, and then. Um, Person, both. I don't know if you know him, Jason Potts. Um, went out on a uh, ale trail with him. Would have been two, three week at ends ago, and it ended up pretty messy. Um, <laughs> but um, um, he was speaking about he was in a brewery. I can't remember which brewery it is. I'll, I'll look up in a moment. Uh, where he was in the basement of this brewery, and they uncovered tons and tons of Atlantic porters from like a hundred odd years ago. And it was in the local uh, Burton Mail, probably about. Um, a year ago or so, and he just that just his story of, of what he uncovered and drinking it afterwards. He said that it felt pretty ill, but it was still good taste, initial taste, anyway. So actually, that leads on to quite an interesting question. What's the what's the oldest beer you've ever had? Oh. See, my, my mine would be probably be, be that um that um the um Prince Charles, whatever it were called. But I guess after that, it were probably a bottle of. 1982 Courage, Courage Russian Imperial Stout, and that wasn't that bad. I mean, if you if you look around on um, on YouTube, I, I kind of I did that video with Zach Avery back when he was doing his channel. I, I took I took a bottle of Three Floyds Dark Lord, which was relatively fresh, and um, a 1982 bottle of Courage Russian, Russian Imperial Stout brewed by John Smiths. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. I think the oldest beer I've had is one of the Rodenbach Alexander beers. Alexander by Rodenbach. Um, it's it's from way before they were bought by Palm Breweries. Okay. It's uh, it, I can't re remember if it was like a Flemish style or it was definitely a sour. I think it was probably Flemish style. Um, and I I tried two vintages side by side. The Last one they brewed, which was with like a regular label, and then an older one, which was uh, with like a painted painted label on, and then wrapped in uh, in like a paper wrapping. And that's probably uh, from sometime in the 80s. Other than that, I tried the first ever batch of uh, Tista Limfjord's Porter, which is uh, if you follow me on 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 tap, <laughs> you can see it's probably the beer I drink the most. <laughs> Yeah, but, but uh, it, it's a dead-on Baltic Porter, and it was the beer that started, or one of the first beers to actually like get crafty things going in Denmark. So it's a very historic beer. But I tried the first batch of that like two years ago, and it was like it was pretty cool. It was super oxidized, and there was no smoke left in it, but still very fun to try. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally going to try and hunt down a bottle that when I'm in. Copenhagen. Oh yeah, you need to. It's uh, <laughs> actually quite hard to find in Copenhagen. Oh really? But you can probably find it some places. Yeah, I remember seeing you. Didn't you have like a big bottle of it? You and your mate recently, like a, a <laughs> magnum of it. Or something. A magnum. They did that for the 25th birthday of the beer. <laughs> that was Last year. Yeah. Uh, my my oldest one off the top of my head was a uh, 1976 uh, Gers. I think it was uh, Dry Fontaine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I went to a well, I went to a world beer. Pounds. Well, I went to a world beer festival in in, uh, in Brooklyn. I was I was just on holiday in, in New York last year, and this festival just happened to be on. And as you walked in the door, um, they they knew how many people were coming. They gave you like I mean the tiniest little fingernail size pour of it. To be perfectly frank, and I do like my sour beers, it was a glass of watery vinegar. Um, I've never been so disappointed, but also so excited <laughs> in my entire life. It was just like... Yeah. I've had a number of those experiences. <laughs> it's a long time. It's a long time. It was probably, it was probably like left out in the sunshine in the boiling heat, and was probably just well past it, you know, but whatever. Yeah. It's part of the fun. Simon? I think, uh, to be honest... It was the just one of the Rodenbach beers, the the Grand Cru. I think Arthur brought it around a few weeks ago. I think it was about three year old. 
Um, but again, unless you try these beers, I would have liked to have compared it to a fresh bottle just to see the difference between a fresh and a, and a three-year-age bottle of Rodenbach. But yeah, that, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question if, if he didn't bring that the other week because I don't really age beers. I, I like to get them in and, and just shoot the reviews up, you know, and, and just get them going. Yeah, I guess I you're... I've got an original bottle of, of Barry Island. I've got that mint chocolate imperial stout down there, and I'm just going to leave them forever. Yeah, and uh, yeah. see where they end up. Exactly. Yeah, you mean, I've got a, got a few bottles that I am aging, but I've never tried them. <laughs> <laughs> so what are they then? Do you remember any? What you you actually purposely put aside? Um, Barry Island. Um, the first batch. No, you, you said you you just said you've you've got some stuff that you've never tried, but you've you're you're aging. The, the other ones, yeah, the Imperial oh, right, okay. Mint Chocolate Imperial Stout with Mastered. Oh, yeah. um, I got a bottle of the Celt, one of the Celt beers I did with them, and the Barry Island IPA, yeah. yeah. So Vintage. Leave oh, and done it and see how it does. Should be working up that um, that that vertical of Barry Island IPA. You know, <laughs> years, you know. well, how about you, Rob? You have you have you kept a bottle of your? Uh, yeah, the metaphor uh, from Bruno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I've got. Um, like leave it forever. I can chip away. I mean, I think I'm down to my last six bottles or something now. But yeah, it's kind of like how many should I keep? I mean, at the moment, I'm not. I'm not drinking. I'm, I mean, when when I did the event uh, um, North Monk recently. I gave in the first pro first prize in the free prize draw. I gave I gave away a bottle of it, um, but uh, which annoyingly was to somebody who had already, I'd already given a bottle to, and they already oh, had no. to me. Oh man! But it, it, it was a couple. I mean, it, so they've got one each. By the way, uh, Rob, do you want to hear something cool? Yeah, go for it. Your collab, Dead Metaphor, was on at CBC last year. It was yes, yeah. Um, Sarah oh, from Brewdog um, tweeted me a picture, but she's like, like homemade kind of like pump clip. She's like, ooh, yeah, I've, got, I've got it somewhere. I mean, I've got it hidden somewhere. But yeah, that that was yeah that was a, a proud moment. Was that? <laughs> Shame the beer was a little bit better. I mean, oh, yeah. It was good, but I mean, it, it wasn't I what I kind of like hoped it. But. I don't remember how it was because I was pretty drunk when I had it. it was exactly. So yeah. on TV. Like you, you run around, it's unlimited pours, and it's just like, oh, I, I want to try that and that and that and that and that. Yeah, your video does. was hilarious. Like your your friend, um, the Duke of Delirium, he was absolutely trashed. <laughs> it was his first <laughs> beer festival. Speak on camera. <laughs> it was his first beer festival ever. He got so drunk. At one point, I was yeah. talking to some of the people from a brewery called uh, Way Beer in Brazil, and he was ang they were next to the uh, uh, Firestone Walker booth, and then Metz, or the Duke of Delirium, was angry, started standing, yelling something, and apparently it was because Firestone Walker ran out of beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up having to take him home with a, with a cab because he was so smashed. Nice. Hey, Pete, are you, are you there late this year? Huh? Are you at CBC this year? I hope to volunteer or find tickets somehow because um, I didn't get tickets this year because uh, when I tried on my computer, I was just completely, completely frozen out from the stupid website yeah. where they sell yeah. tickets. Do you know what? I, I went back. I went back six hours afterwards and just went, "Oh, I'll just give it a shot," and I got two tickets six hours after the. After after the what? sale went out live, I I, I was there at midnight when when I was like clicking away, pressing refresh. Uh, God knows how I managed to get two tickets, but there we go. Mental. Mental. I really it's like absolutely fast, really. It's it's probably the best beer festival I've ever been to. If you're into trying uh, crazy beers and just everything that's going on in Copenhagen because of it, it's so fun. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Yeah. So hopefully I'll see you there if you manage to get some tickets or something. Oh yeah. For sure. I'm, I'm guessing Rob's not moving his arm. Can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, now I can. I, now I just, I was, I was, um, yeah, I can move. I can move things on. Um, anybody got a question? I mean, I can I had a few. I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, can, can I ask one? 
Is that right? Feeling powered. Is oh, feeling powered. Feeling powered. Cool. Right. Um, so this is this is a bit. Uh, it's probably a bit contentious, and uh, but uh, I don't feel I'm the only one. So. Um, right. Is it which is your favourite? Do you want Andrew? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very contentious <laughs> question. Because my, 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 my because my answer to that question is neither. Uh, it's like you know, <laughs> try, it's like trying to choose between two children, right? Um, no. So um, we got a batch of we got a cask of Jaipur in at the at the pub mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I tapped it, spiled it, poured out a little, you know, checking the clarity of it a couple of days later. Uh, gave it a smell, went that doesn't smell like Jaipur. Tried it and went that doesn't taste. Like I'm in my Jaipur, um, and I thought, just, oh well, it's just a bad, bad, bad bar. It was really catty, really um, butyric. It was just like all the worst qualities out of really resinous hops, I suppose. Um, and then um, I tried a bottle, and the bottle was was great. And I went, well, yeah, it's definitely just a bad, bad batch. Now I've tried Jaipur X, which everyone's kind of clamoured after, and I've, I've seen your your review, Rob, and you were quite you you quite liked it, and and. I could, I could genuinely say it's quite it's quite a nice double IPA. I thought it was definitely like it was all the flavours of a normal Jaipur elevated, but unfortunately yeah. for me, it was the flavours of this bad batch of Jaipur. This this oh, this really? one that I didn't like elevated. So that cattiness for me in this bottle was so extreme. It was like drinking, yeah, it was like vomit. It was just really intense. <laughs> and I was really I was really not happy with it at all. Now I had a conversation with a couple of friends of mine, and they they. Uh, yeah. So some of them were like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't work out when I tried it last why I didn't like it. Um, and there's like about five or six of my mates who are real big geeks, and and they look, and I'm a massive fan of Jaipur. Just as I, if I see it on a bar, and, and you know, yeah. it, it's a good, it's a good choice, right? It's a really good choice, yeah. a really nice beer. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying it out of hatred or competition. I'm just saying it. But yeah, me and this group of really good beer geek friends kind of agree. And then I've got another group of friends who are like. They know what you're talking about. It's absolutely brilliant. It's not tasted any different at all. So, has anyone had any experience recently? And I know we all tend to try different beers, but has, any, has anyone noticed that at all? Because um, I've got a feeling it might be about um, flavour thresholds. Maybe I'm just really partial to kind of butyric acid flavours, because that's definitely what it is. It's butyric acid. I, I know that flavour um, from my history as biochemist. But yeah, so anyone... how, how do you how do you define that kind of that flavour? So if you get a, a citrus single hot beer and you smell it, and sometimes you get this really fusty, catty, ammonia-like no. And, it, and <laughs> right, the best way to say it, uh, butyric acid is a major component in vomit. So it's a real kind of almost vomity smell, right? Um, I know it sounds really rank, but it's not. It's not as intense or it's literally physically repulsive as that. But it, it's a no, and I can get it, and it makes me kind of go, you know, it, it, it's obviously, but it's just in this it's enough level for me to kind of make it, me kind of get it, and then when I taste it, I still get the same flavour. Um, so I guess stupidly, stupidly kind of ammonia esque is the best way to put it. Cat pee. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't go near the um, the hindquarters of a cat very often. So. <laughs> well, uh, right. that's, you know, uh, what cat pee smells like? All that, but I know what you mean. It's like ammonia. It's that yeah. kind of thing. Um, I, I kind of get. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I think some some beers, maybe sometimes when they're a little bit fresh, can be a bit like that. Um, and it's maybe sometimes how it's used. It's like with um, Simcoe. I think Simcoe is a yeah, real. I get it. I get it a lot from Simcoe. Yeah, yeah I get it. and it's just a bit. Uh, and I'm not, not a massive fan of it. But I had I had a, I this actually from Salt Air, which is re released today. <laughs> oh, wow. The Imperial South, Imperial IPA, and that is um, Galaxy and Simcoe. Galaxy is a big kind of like pungent hot. I mean, I remember having when Brudo did their. <coughs> Uh, IPA is dead, and I remember it smelling like um, manure. I mean, in a nice way, but it's, I guess I guess what you're saying is a component of um, vomit. So the manure element of what I got from that galaxy was the kind of that oh. was like a sweetness. I mean, there's like a there's like an odd kind of spicy sweetness to the smell of manure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's bit, a but the shitty side to a bit, shitty bit to one side. It's that other bit, which is kind of like it's hard to define. But but the Simcoe in that was just it was just all it was all kind of like um, raspberry and, and quite dank, but not excessively dank. And I think they did a really nice job with that. Yeah. And that's a filtered beer from probably I know so I usually get their stuff filtered at Robinsons. Um, but that they did a really nice job with that. And I didn't get any I didn't get much if any of that yeah. in that beer, which is really really impressive. I think it's like 
wire backers, double Simco, I don't know anything from that at all. But then sometimes quite so, quite a lot with um, yeah. hardcore IPA. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. No, I'm. I'm just wondering because it's. Uh, t- uh, yeah. Perhaps to me, it just became really noticeable. But I, I saw. I. I genuinely saw a wholesale, a wholesale shift in in the in in the flavour of the beer. Um, I'm yeah. just interested to see what other beer reviewers thought because I mean, it's not like it's. Uh, it's not like a humongous issue, but I'm just interested in seeing if other people get certain flavours, I suppose. Yeah. I, I like to say I trust my palate, and and um, and I, yeah, I'm generally quite receptive and quite fine with with most stuff. Um, but for some reason, uh, the latest batch of Jaipur and the Jaipur X are just really giving me an intensely, <laughs> for me, off flavour. I mean, and it's yeah, genuinely so much yeah. so that it's like I can't actually drink this. This is so depressing. <laughs> I want to drink it. <laughs> I, I had it on keg relatively recently. I remember. It being I mean, as it always is, pretty, pretty decent. Um, as far as kind of like off that particular thing, I, I guess it's is it is it more of a, more of a personal thing? I mean, certain people can kind of tolerate certain things, and other people can't. For me, well, I, I'm I diastole. I, I can't go for diastole. Yeah. 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 That, that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I was just wondering if it was a personal sort of. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. if there's a certain chemical, I'm more, I'm more yeah. receptive to than others. That's, that's exactly. the case yeah, what I was yeah. trying to find out. Yeah. I, remember, I remember Simon saying um, a while back yeah. about... Um, he seems to have a lot of with this kind of like burnt rubber, which you, yeah. you can like pet- <laughs> petrol kind of thing yeah. as well. I mean, and, I, mean and I was told by a brewer that a lot of time... I mean, there's, a, there's various kind of ways, but uh, various ways that can happen, but I mean, he told me... I mean, it can be like a dirty, like a, quite a burnt element. But then Nelson Solving when it's really fresh. Can, br- can bring out that kind of like smoky bacon, um, petrol-y thing as well. But, so I remember Simon, Simon a while back kind of like not being very keen on that. So is that something you're quite um, susceptible? Or is it something that... Uh, or, or is there other things off flavours? It might, be, might not be even off flavours. It might be certain things that just kind of like... Um, I mean, don't, you just don't get on with. Uh, uh, me, yeah. Um, no, Simon. Oh, Simon, sorry. Yeah. Well, I remember that conversation. We were we were in the Earl of Essex pub oh, yeah. in London. Yeah, we were drinking a porter. But yeah, we were talking in a beer guy, lovely sunshine, completely different from the weather today. Um, and yeah, I, I, I had a couple of the beers from Mohawk Brewing Company in, in Sweden. Mm. I, I gave I gave Rob a couple um, a, a few years back, and it had just it was like burning rubber. And then I kind of once you associate something in your mind like that, it's difficult to get away from. My Mel, my wife, she'll always say a whole garden will taste like baked beans. <laughs> When somebody says that to you, when somebody, you <laughs> yeah, exactly. You take that sip of beer and tell them it tastes like baked beans. That's it. It's over. You get baked beans and it's gone. So I asked for a while this burning rubber taste with certain beers. And it was only until, well, we sat down and we talked about it in this beer garden that I kind of got talked out of it. And, and it's kind of never come back. In a weird way. <laughs> That's so true, though. Once someone, if you're sitting a few people, and once someone says some weird tasting note or off flavor, and you actually get it in your head and you start picking it up, it just won't leave the glass. You just ah, yeah. keep smelling it. I, I completely know that feeling. Yeah. So, would you like me to ruin IPAs for you? <laughs> oh, no. <Yeah. laughs> Is um. I, I seem to notice metallic in in only in some really really strong like uh, the ones in Flying Dog we had Flying Dog there so, uh, uh, Raging Bitch for example that has a real strong metallic so does Brew Dog's Hardcore IPA as much as I love it it has a really strong metallic t- flavour in it. it I just find it's, it's IPAs are the one thing that cause the strong metallic flavours to come in for me I don't know what it's come from but it's Possibly the malt or something. I, I don't really know. 
Hmm. Uh, I wonder if that's just residual bitterness, some some really harsh bitterness, and the, the resin on the tongue or something. Mm. Yeah, you, you you guys are probably right to be honest. I probably just got it in my head. I probably just had a sip of it. That really tastes the manual, and it's just stuck in my head. Um, but it's just interesting to see what other people's opinions are. Adam, Pia, would you like to chime in? Anything that gets on your nerves? Anything, any sort of flavours? I mean, it's like people love kind of ropey macro lagers while in green bottles and stuff. I mean, and it, it's kind of part of that particular beer. I mean, a lot of people might really like Heineken. I mean, but it is clearly skunked. But people might personally like that um, that flavour. Skunk flavour. <laughs> what do you mean? I like, uh, they, like Jay Terrio does a lot of kind of um, lager reviews. I'm sure he quite he's quite fond of certain characteristics of a lot of kind of macro lagers. I mean, I mean not everybody's got the same taste, though. So, um, he's kind of I guess some people are just kind of like more yeah more kind of sensitive to it than than others. Yeah, and I, also I think I, I think sorry, Peter, go. On. I also think it's like if we're talking skunk, if you're and used to just drinking beer that are skunky, then you've never had anything else, and then you're just like, oh, that, that tastes like beer. Unless you then try something that's not skunky and tastes different, it's like, oh, what? And I, I, I see how some people, when they try craft beers or different beers, and they're used to that skunky green lager, then maybe the craft beer they t- try tastes off because they're used to the skunk flavor. Yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. I, I have, I've had that with some of my friends who drink lagers and stuff, and they're like, when they try craft beer, they're like, oh, it doesn't taste like beer. Weird. Even if it's been like mild stuff, but I, yeah, I don't know. I think the bitterness definitely gets to them straight away because they don't, especially hoppy beers, you know, like IPAs, pale ales. I think people are just like, wow, that's really, really bitter. And, and I sort of think to myself, no, it's not at all. But then again, if I had never drunk those beers before, then I guess bitterness yeah. would be the, the prevalent flavor or the you know that sort of taste. But I think I just caught the back end of what Harry was just saying there. But um, metallic aftertastes in beers just piss me off so much because it really just shows that there's been no care in the brewing process. And then all of a sudden, once you get that metallic flavor, you kind of think to yourself, well, actually, you know, compared to other beers that I've tasted and the way that it looks in the glass, that, you know, the, the mouthfeel, all, all these sorts of things, it's just not a quality kind of care, care brewed beer. And then you just kind of, yeah, that's the thing that really, really irritates me about certain beers. But I, I don't get it very often. Um, can, can, mostly with gonna, crappy English beers. So I, I'm just gonna, <laughs> if I, I'm gonna try showing someone this. This is a tasting. Can you, can you, can you read that? Can, can people see what it says? Nope. No. Right. I'll, I'll read it. So, so this is this is from a a, a local microbrewery. Uh, Rob, you'll hate this. Uh, medium bodied golden session bitter, nutty toffee aroma with complex butterscotch flavours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So you know how we talk about no care for the broom. You know how we're saying for no care with the broom process. Now there's 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 not necessarily there's producing a bit that might have some mild butterscotchy dastal notes to it, right? And then there's actually actively trumpeting the fact that your beer is now this is like a, a sessionable exactly. bitter. It's like a traditional English sessionable bitter, and I. I'm so knocked off with traditional brewing skills in England. It's like, oh, because it's traditional and because people liked it for a while, they're going to like it. It's like, no, you need to be producing clean, fermented, well looked after, well cared for beers. Yes, some level of butterscotch in a beer is fine, but there's a lot of buttery... Oh, yeah, you're just you know run of the mill <laughs> bitters going around. That actually more so than more so than a craft beer like Jaipur being slightly not so brilliant this batch <laughs> is the majority of like rubbish bitters. Oh, it's this is this beer sells so well, right? <laughs> in the local area, it just sells all day, every day. People see it and they go, "Pint of that, please." You know, I'm obviously not saying who it is because that's really rude. But it's like, oh man, that's just absolutely. It drains my soul. I just wish to say to people, you realise that's the fermentation error you're drinking right there. Yeah. Uh, oh. Anyway, <laughs> see, there's um, um, a, a question. Oh, go on. There's a, there's another of us who know the. Sorry, um, there's, oh, a, there's a number of us who have been to the Grove in Huddersfield. You know, I've been, 
Uh, yeah. Simon's been, um, Adam's been, oh, Jack's yeah. probably been. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have, um, periodically they get a beer in called uh, Bathen's Bitter. And oh, it's God. massively sought after. And, and as, when it comes on at the Grove, it goes, it'll be gone in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. And it's a traditional best bitter. It's, it is what it is. It's decent. But it probably, it, but it does have a bit of dice style in there. I, I just reviewed that the other day. That's actually a local beer to me, oh, and, that's, right. and that sells really, really well in their in their. Uh, they've got they've got pubs around here as well, and it sells oh, so right. so well. Um, but yeah, I, I got because when I made my uh, order from my local bottle shop, there were some beers they couldn't get me, so we just chucked in loads of random beers. I, I've I've had almost every single one of them, but yeah. I was just so <laughs> thankful. Um, but. Um, yeah, the the Bathams or I don't I don't know what to call it, Bathams or Bathams, whatever. But I had it, it was like, yeah, it's it's okay. It's it's pretty, it's it's one of the worst bitters I suppose I've had. But you mean if if you if you've not heard of the Grove or been to the Grove, I mean it's they've got like thirty seven beers, all really high end stuff. After the bars, cask, after the the other side of the pub as well, kegging stuff from all over the country. You know, the best stuff around. But th- yeah. but when this beer turns up, people will flock around miles around. <laughs> and <laughs> who, who are we to disagree, right? People drink it, people drink it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with yeah. it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. As long, uh, but the point, I guess, what you're making, as long it's intended to be there. Don't celebrate your your, yeah. your shortcomings as a as a an industry industrial food manufacturer. What, I mean, that's it, was, what you it, was, it was more a point on generally in pride in the brewing process. You yeah. you're a professional brewer, you're meant to brew a good quality product <laughs> and you're meant to do it with a bit of integrity and it yeah. kinda knocks me that it, it's it's a little bit lost, right? So people take the piss out of someone being passionate about beer. Um but you know, oh, I see, I see. All uh, oh, right, right. I've, I've been told to spill the beans on the beer. Um, <laughs> no, because the problem is uh, we utilise their. Um, we yeah, okay, fine. I'll do that. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> but, um, I'll, I'll I'll do that. But um, yeah, I utilise their services um, for for the for the brewery because they they're very helpful and they're lovely people. Mm. And I know some of them personally, so I'll type it. But <laughs> <laughs> I've said it to the faces in fairness. I've said it to the faces in fairness, but uh, oh, well, much, much more politely because I'm not. I'm not the sort of guy like you know. No. They like to think I go behind people's backs, but yeah, I'll type it to you now. <laughs> <laughs> Just whilst Jack's doing that, I've actually got a question for uh, for Peter because recently, obviously, uh, recently me and Rob met up and had a bit of a. Um, had a bit of a day out in Manchester, and we were discussing um, the ales by mail. Sorry, I'm just reading what Jack's just put there. Okay, got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently, we were just discussing the um, the ales by mail um, batch, the stuff, the stuff that you get from ales by mail, Peter. And I, I, I can't help but think that obviously. The, the reason why you're getting such a variety of different beers is because you know you you need they need to send a variety to you to show what they actually stock. Um, but what do you actually think to some of the newer UK breweries? Because admittedly, you've not had probably some of the better beers um, that we would probably send you, but you've had some decent wants to be fair. Um, I mean, what do you think about the up and coming stuff in the UK from the traditional side to now the craft side? Well, um, I went to uh, well, I've, I've had a lot of it before uh, the new UK stuff. Not just yeah. because of the by mail, but also because uh, McKellar is very good at inviting uh, up and coming UK breweries to uh, CBC, but mostly oh, the breweries okay. he's friends with and stuff. But also uh, in 2012 or 2013, yeah, 2013 I think it was I went to the UK and uh, to brew a collab. And I made up with both Rob and Simon. Yeah, you went to the Colonel, right? Yeah, I went to the Colonel, all, all kinds of places yeah. with uh, Rob. Rob was uh, showing us around, and, along with some friends I have who had a brewery called Three Friends Brewing. Uh, but it was really cool, and I think it's really nice that something like that is going on in London. And I think London, or not London in general, but what I can gather at the moment, uh, that these new, a lot of these new UK breweries try to either make a, a old Inspired appears inspired by old like London-based recipes, at least for the London breweries, and then also uh, a lot of session beer, like super hoppy session beer, 
But then you also get again something like Wild Beer doing you know new stuff, and I think it's really cool. Uh, I think it's much cooler than a lot of the traditional stuff. Actually, when I got into craft beer, that was the English ales. It was uh, traditional English ESBs and stuff like that, and that still has a place for me. Uh, but I guess I somewhat grew out of that. Uh, I, I'll drink it on occasion. It's very rare, but I think it's very cool to see these new up-and-coming breweries. I mean, a brewery like Siren are making killer beers. They're yeah, awesome. definitely. Uh, I, I've become a big fan of Beaver Town as well. Gamma Ray. I've had it on tap now a few times. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, awesome stuff. Um, again, Old Ford Export Stout by Red Church is good. It seems like stuff is going on over there, which is it's, it's cool. They're they're doing some interesting stuff for sure. I had, just, the, I had the um, Hoxton special what you reviewed the other week. I had that today on, on, on keg. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it's a long time since I've had that beer. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I it gave it like a 93 or something, I figured. Yeah, I was like, what the it fuck? Some, I didn't expect it. Takes a beer to impress beer as far as IPA goes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I had it on, on, on keg today. It was, yeah, it was pretty good. And I actually think I had it when we were in London. I'm not entirely sure, but it was old or something like on cast when we were in the, the Camden area. I'm not entirely yeah. sure, but we tried a lot of beer. Yes. <laughs> uh, interesting on on the subject of English beers. Um, there's an article in All About Beer magazine from America. I just spied it on on on. on, on I think it was. Uh, UK craft beer network or something, but uh, essentially saying the complete opposite of what we're saying. Uh, it was saying that British new British brewers were doing the American thing and had lost the unique Britishness of, of uh, brewing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, <laughs> Simon's opinion is very abundant and clear right now. But um, yeah, I disagree. I disagree with the article as well because um, I think it's maybe a different style. I don't think just because a beer is pale, crisp, and hoppy, it can necessarily be called American in style. Yeah, maybe it's using American hops. Yes, maybe it's using New World hops in general. Um, but I still think um, if a brewery in a country is brewing good beers, no matter if it's something more intense and hoppy or something more imperial and dark and it's less focused on the traditions, I don't see a huge issue with that. Um, but they were kind of like citing Colonel saying, all, all Colonel do really is nice, pale, hoppy, American-style bitters. Well, if you read what Evan says himself about his own brews, he says, I wanted to say the best things about American brewing, that it was just simplicity and produced simplicity in England. Um, he's got a really interesting thing in one of Mark Dredge's books, an interview with him, uh, and I think the way he explains it, he does it in a kind of I don't know, you really managed to explain. I'm not nicking American craft beer and saying, oh, it'll sell just because it's a hoppy beer, it'll sell. No, he's really put thought and effort into it and made pale beers his own style, you know, and, and yeah. does them really well. Um, so it's, if you want to say the, ca the counter argument to, to, I guess, people, I guess, just kind of go, yeah, Ameri you know, English craft brewery is getting really getting out there. And read this all about beer article and see what an American who loves English traditional beers says. Because she loves cask beer and says, weirdly, it says you can't find any cask beer in England anymore. I was like, no, actually. Uh, <laughs> no, actually. Uh, I, 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 yeah, well, it, I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think that we're talking London centric sort of opinion. Yeah, here, definitely. Right? So obviously, she, the, this person's probably know, going to the craftiest yeah. English bars mm. and probably finding more keg than they thought they were going to try. Shall I put it that way? Is, is that more fair? But it's such a novelty in the US cask beer, uh, as keg mm -hmm. sort of was to us for a while. Um, so I think it's so much more exciting to see something that's not American. Do you know what I mean? Well, we're kind of like we've seen English. I've just been moaning about butterscotchy best beers, right? So it, to me, it's so much more exciting. So is it again just opinions and taste? Yeah, but whatever. Yeah, but there's plenty absolutely. of traditional style English beer. There is an abundance of that, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. And some of the best, uh, uh, and some of the biggest breweries that have been doing it for a while do the best examples of that. Um, yeah. Which is why they're still big, right? Fuller's, for example, they do. Fuller's, Fuller's, Fuller's do some great stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Can't deny it. Won't deny it. Great British best bitters, uh, stouts, porters, that sort of stuff. Um, but surely there's got to be plenty of variety. And I think there is a lot of variety in England. More so than there ever has been. And long may it live, you know? What I actually awesome. kind of think... What I kind of think with uh, a lot... Well, uh, regarding that article and stuff, I think a lot of like the newer UK breweries, I said they're focusing on more sessionable stuff. So in some ways, they're keeping with UK tradition, because as far as I can gather from over there, you guys drink more lower ABV beers than the Americans do. A lot it's kind of like, yeah. it's, it's like taking 
inspiration from American tradition and British tradition and mixing it up together. In my mind, with a lot of the stuff like with the Beaver Town and Pale Ales and Session IPAs, whatnot, I, I think it's kind of a mix, mixing all thing. Uh, is there a way I can post the link to this article? Because I've just found it. Uh... In the chat box. All right, does it work? Does that pop up? Yeah, cool. I'll send that to you guys now. There you go. Cool. So, awesome. yeah, if you if you want to read it, it's called Culture Shock: British Beer Taking Cues from America in the All About Beer magazine. It's got oh. a big picture of Gamma Ray on on the front cover of it. So, if you want to have a read, there you go. It's um it's, interesting to see what people think. I just don't understand. Sorry, Rafael. The reason why I was having a little bit of a thing, I don't really understand why she's kind of saying it's dead or whatever it was, because um. Well, maybe she's not into super hobby stuff and whatnot, but for a lot of the British public to get to try what beer is like that is similar to what's in America, they'd have to try local breweries' interpretation of it because there is such a huge difference from drinking like a fresh IPA in the U.S. to drinking it four or five months old over here. Mm-hmm. I rarely buy American IPAs here in Denmark because I know... That beer has probably been sitting on the shelf for two months, and it's been like two to three months to get here. So it's just yeah. so rare. Unless I've heard from friends saying, oh, it's good. Okay, I'll pick up a bottle. Uh, or I can see a bottled on date. Like uh, I tried uh, not too long ago, I reviewed Founders All Day IPA, IPA with my dad. And I've steered clear of that for a long time when Founders got back here because I was, oh, was going to be old. Then I found the bottle with a bottled on date, and it was only like one or two months old. And that's... Yeah. Quite fresh. <laughs> We're um, so, yeah. Yeah, for I mean, recently, a um, bottle shop um, close to where I work in York, they um, they've got a, they've got a delivery of Odell stuff in, like maybe like two weeks back now. It was because the, the, the they were um, uh, they had the new release of uh, Runoff Red IPA, which is very good. That yeah. that was maybe at most two months old. They had bottles of Mercenary, which were um, bottled, kind of, I think, two days before Christmas. Not too bad, really. But then they had bottles of St. Lupo in, which is their summer beer. <laughs> yeah. That was bottled in, like, July. And they had the, they had, this is one I couldn't get my head around. They had bottles of the IPA as well, which was actually a little bit earlier than St. Lupo in. So, oh. shipping in. I mean, brand new in that shop, same delivery as something that is at the most two months old. There's beers that are fucking like nine months old. Yeah. Eight to nine months. It's just mental. But you mean, just as a customer, I walk in that shop, ooh, what's new in? As I yeah. do. And then you buy the new stuff. <laughs> it, but if it didn't have the bottle day on, I, I, I mean, and a lot of people will still pick those beers up. I mean, in, in, it's a funny because New York is such a, 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 t- a tourist area, such a tourist town, really. I mean, a historical place. Um, their core audience are, are, are people buying presents and and and, um, and tourists. I mean, and then there's a, I'm sure there's a core group of people who go in there every day and uh, have been uh, honestly badgering them about this. Because so I went up to the guy who kind of does the beer order and we're like, before I said he, he were like. Yeah, we're getting it in next Wednesday. You're like the sixth person, and it's like half past twelve. You're like sixth person is coming after about cans of bloody orange. We're getting some off this again, something. <laughs> but I mean, so there are people who go there for that. But I mean, if somebody go, this is the disappointing thing as well. I mean, if that beers, if you go and buy a, that bottle of Odell IPA, which is from July last year, you will not buy that beer again because it's not what it should be, and that is. One, that is a fantastic beer. It's one of the better American IPAs. Definitely. And the problem, is, is that, the problem is probably also that uh, it's going to put them off maybe from the brewery because some people who don't know too much about that stuff are like, oh, that's not too good. So then it makes them not maybe care as much about getting stuff from that given brewery, I'd imagine. Well, I've had... So um, I think, so think Simon's going to... Sorry to interrupt. I think yeah. Simon's going to have to leave us. He's, he's got to go and put his hair in rollers. Yeah, hair in so rollers. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll say farewell. Guys, it was a great night. Enjoy the series. Uh, I'll be back in March. <laughs> <laughs> See you, man. Until next time. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.
So, uh, where the hell are we going to be here until 2 in the morning? I'm going to I'm going to Hey, I've, I've got to be up for work at 5 o'clock as well, so... Oh, fuck I don't you, think I'm excuse excuse oh, You're not fucking out. <laughs> He's a lot older than you. <laughs> I have a winter break. I don't have to get up unless I want to. <laughs> well, there you go. Me, me, you me, should me. get yeah. some bed and barrel aged imperial stats down your neck tonight, Peter. You have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have any bed and barrel aged stuff. At <gasps> Shock! I drank it all. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Uh, uh, so I, I, was, I think we need to send Peter some books and stuff, honestly. Yeah. Peter needs to get some books and stuff in his life, because uh, if he thinks that, obviously, the UK are, are doing more session-type stuff, I mean, books are one of the exceptions on that, I guess. I know they've done some very low ABB stuff, right. I know they have, but their bigger ABB stuff is, is just, yeah. But I think I think that's kind of the irony of the English brewing scene is that what's sessionable to other people is actually just standard to us, right? Because <laughs> yeah. when, when, I know it's a, I, I, but when 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 I was in America and they're kind of like session beers, anything kind of hovering around five percent, and I'm like, if I serve half of these five percent is in the British probably like, ooh, look, it's five percent, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, right. that's so, but right. I think I think that's probably that's probably a very British thing is that I genuinely mean I think we do the best low ABV beers. Out there, some American session beers are like water and you know really water and really hoppy, and uh, really sorry, really astringently bitter. So I think that's probably yeah, the thing I that we do the best because we've got more experience doing our, our malts is more sweet, I suppose. Our hops tend to be less pungent, so they suit lower ABV beers, I guess. That's uh, there you go. Flying the flag for British brewing now. Now it's like it upper hours. <laughs> but no, definitely. That's a, that's an interesting point, though. I mean, it's uh, low ABV beers. Because uh, there, uh, there are there, there, obviously even in the UK, there's this trend of session IPAs. Mm. Not that we really need a trend of session IPAs, um, because the, that that's came out of a, uh, the American market because they're obsessed with IPA. That's probably the most popular style within craft beer. So they want low ABV because I mean you can't be drinking pint after pint of seven uh, percent IPA. So they're going for that lower ABV beer. Uh, obviously in the UK, we have got. The, we, we've got a history of doing low AB, low ABV, tasteful. I mean, so flavorful, uh, tasty beers. Um, but we kind of we 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 kind of trying to do what America are doing, even within this small little niche of the beer market. It's kind of like, but do we need to? Should we? Should we kind of like stick to? But even if you look at beers like uh, like Dark Star Op-Ed, which um, it's been around for a long time. It's like um, thingy, um, summer lining, uh, hot back summer lining. I mean, that's relatively low ABV. I can't remember what hops are in it, but quite a, quite a hoppy beer, really, by your kind of like layman standards. Should yeah. should we bother? Should we in the UK? Do, should we bother to yeah. like follow that trend? Because do we need it? Should we stick to? Are, are you it, actually seriously what, questioning whether or not we should have more hoppy beers in our lives? No, should, should we, <laughs> do, we need, do we need kind of uh, American and kind of New Zealand hot low ABV beers? Because as, as Jack said, the, those hops complement those malts, and, and that's that's where that works. Well, and, um, to to kind of hijack it a little bit, we've no, um, no, no. we produce in Atom a uh, 3.5% uh, beer called Schrodinger's Cat, which is more kind of like an experiment in ourselves. So this is our kind of version of a right. It, it, we don't call it session IPA for a start. <clears throat> Terminology don't really work with it, but it's three and a half percent. We do we we mash it in stupidly hot. We use the same amount of malt in it as we do in the full blown five point six percent IPA that we make. Same amount of malt, same amount of sugar comes out of that beer. Not as much gets fermented. It's all big chains of beta glucans that don't get fermented. Give body to a beer. So um, it's really costly to make. It's really fun to make because we mess around and it, uh, we've got a guy from the University of Hull to help us out designing it in a way to not get out any off flavours um, and actually we did it as more of a bit of a fun experiment to make a really hoppy beer at three and a half percent and I swear to god sometimes when it's on a bar you see people order it because it's the lowest ABV thing on the bar and it comes and it's brown in colour um, 
it's hilarious to see the consequences. <laughs> Makes me laugh. The untaps on it are absolutely hilarious as well. It's like, really, really hoppy. What is this? <laughs> it's like it's a hoppy ice beer, actually. <laughs> yeah, but um, well, it's funny actually because Th- Thornbridge recently did um, a session ale, AMPM, and I I really enjoyed it. I thought it was actually a really really nice session ale. It was really well balanced for such a low ABV. But they didn't need to do it, you know. They've got other beers that are pretty Wild much Swan. the same. Yeah, they, like yeah, Wild Swan. Um, What's that, like three point something. Three five. Yeah, exactly. Uh, why did they need to do one just to follow a trend? Although it was a damn good exactly. beer, you know, it didn't it didn't need to be done. But I guess it's been bought. They're making money off it. It's following the trend. It's semantics at the end of the day. It's, it's yeah, semantics. Okay. Uh, it means the, the phrase session IPA means a lot more to an American because it is actually a much lower ABV. Mm. To us, really, is it just a, a, an extra an extra pale ale, an extra hoppy pale ale, something yeah, like that, yeah, an extra yeah. hoppy bitter? I, I don't know. It's just a different different word. It, it, essentially, session IPA means lower ABV than a, an IPA, but with the same sort of flavours as an IPA. So uh, we're still technically using it right, but let's be honest, three point eight to about five, six, maybe slightly more is is kind of acceptable to the mainstream of English beer drink is uh, not, yeah, not the kind of crafty yeah. side. And, and I know it sounds really, you know, but, but, but anything that kind of above that and you really start to turn some heads in, in kind of more conservative beer drinkers, yeah. right? Exactly. I mean, this, this reminds me while I was thinking of um, this came out of a, a friend of mine kind of lamenting his, his hangover two days later because he was he'd been drinking pints of uh, Magic Rock Cannonball, which is 7% <laughs> <laughs> sure, this, Good taste, though, so, right? I mean, I, is, what if I could handle it? <laughs> it's an incredible beer, but it's not, in, it's not intended to be drunk as a pint. I mean, um, no. historically, the UK beer culture is low ABV in its, in its, in its volume. I mean, it's tasty. Low ABV beers, which is all well and good, but the attitude towards, I mean, the beer, the beer world is changing in the UK. I'm sure it is in, in in Denmark as well. I guess you've got a slightly younger kind of beer culture, really, mm-hmm. in that sense. But I mean, um, that, but, it, but it, it, the beer is changing. It's getting stronger. Punk IPA 5.4. I mean, Stella is seen as kind of like bloody hell. I mean, oh, bloody hell, Stella at like what 4.6 yeah. or something. I mean that's that's a session ale, but that was that's that's wife beer. That's a, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's loopy yeah, juice. It's true, yeah. I, I yeah. mean, I'm I mean, sure what? you guys across it amongst like your your family and so on, thinking, oh bloody hell, how strong is that? But the the attitude, our attitude towards beer hasn't changed. People will still drink pints of taste to beer. I mean, Cannonball is an incredible beer, one of the best beers in the country, but you shouldn't drink a pint of it. No, no. And I, I'm trying to explain my drinking, my drinking preferences, and the way I drink to other people is really difficult for them. Like, so when we've got a strong one on in the bar, when we we produce a strong one, like the Four Boston and Dame was seven percent, you know. Uh, I'm trying to explain to people that actually I would drink this in a third glass, you know, yeah, maybe a exactly. third, potentially a half. If I'm really, really going gunning for it, I'll go for two thirds. You know what I mean? It's and it's a different thing. But again, this is we're just at the beginning of it, right? It's in the past few years has genuinely exploded. So I think uh, tendencies will change. People will begin to understand more. Uh, more and more micro pubs uh, are starting to serve thirds glasses. Uh, more and more bars are starting to serve things in thirds. If you ask for it, they'll definitely do one for you. Um, Price of beer is like going like that in terms of keg yeah. beer, especially imported keg. So perhaps thirds becomes economic, um, sensible in terms of ABV, and might become more and more preferable. I'm not worried uh, in, in, in any in any terms because as long as it's still coming in and I can still get a half or a third, I'll, I'll drink it like that. I think glassware has a lot to say about it as well. Get a third glass, a nice tulip stem glass. Get a third in that. It looks so much more than a half pint glasses like that. You're like, what is yeah. this? Oh, well, this, uh, this. So this is, this is 400 centiliter glass, right? You know? And yeah. I've got about probably a third of a pint in there, I guess. Looks massive, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, Psychological. That's, that's, you've got a point, though. I mean, it's like yesterday, I went to the um, kind of preview night at the New Bradford Brewery, um, and they uh, they, were ser- they were serving pints and uh, uh, pints in the average kind of like straight sided Nordic, and then the um, the arms were like uh, you mean like a, like a literally 
straight kind of like slim glass, but you'll get like a Bacardi and Coke. And, and I mean, I'm drinking half, me and my mate are drinking halves of like Siren and Soundwave, which is, it was absolutely raging that night. Last night, it was tasting incredible. And, but it's like, I, did, I resented my hand <laughs> to drink it. It's, it's like Bacardi and fucking Coke glass. Like, this is incredible. Dude, that's the That man in the glass, um, well, it should have been done better. I mean, come on, where's your, ske- where's your stemware? Yeah, come on. Stemware, man. Good things me. I mean, everybody's got to sit in the same glass these days. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I, like a, I like a good glass. But, um, it should be fit for purpose, but I don't want some crappy kind of like glass which is intended for a um, like a yeah soft a, a, a soft ring yeah yeah because I choose not to drink a pint because I because it's five it is five point four so I choose I, I'll have two halves of it but I won't have a pint <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference there's a... <laughs> just whilst um, just whilst Peter's just come back I'm, I'm actually interested in. If you go into any regular kind of bar in Denmark, what do you what are you likely to see on keg or on tap compared to the UK? Um, well, in, it's it's so different in Denmark. I I mean like we have Copenhagen, which is like for me one of the beer capitals of Europe. You can go to so many different bars and they're going to have amazing stuff on tap. Then we have uh, Ulmse, which is uh, a big city on the island of Funen. They have a semi-decent selection. Then we have Aarhus, which is another big uh, city. They have a uh, semi-decent selection. And the same here. It's kind of like everything is centered in Copenhagen. And then you have different bars around, around in some cities around the country that has a kind of varied selection. But in my city, that changed not too long ago. With a new bar opening called Basement Beer Bar, I did a oh, uh, yeah, a, yeah. a little video down there. But before the, before that, if we're talking draft beer, we had uh, an English pub called the Wharf, which was uh, one of the only places outside of the UK who had the camera cask mark, and they have like <laughs> uh, a gravity poured uh, cask system, and they do some nice stuff. But it's mostly traditional British cask ales, and they're the more traditional. What you'd find in British pubs. And then we have a few bars that call themselves pubs, but they serve Carlsberg beers and then um, uh, whatever Carlsberg imports. So uh, Leffe and Hogarden and, and those kind of beers. And then yeah. there was this one place called John Bull Pub, which for a while just had crazy stuff on tap and import, uh, got a lot of cool bottles and stuff. <laughs> Um, and then that stopped, and the guy who was in charge of the bottle selection and stuff decided to open his own place, which is what it is. What the, the new place we have now called Basement Beer Bar, uh, which has get stuff, they get good stuff on keg, right? Oh yeah, mostly keg, that, that place is crazy keg wise. Um, it's kind of like inspired by the uh, brewer or the the places in uh, in Copenhagen. And, uh, uh, it, no, no, no. and and it has uh, 20 taps oh. with a different uh, tap, uh, keg beers, and then one uh, tap which is especially for uh, nitro. Bang, beers. One, two, three, Bangla. <laughs> so uh, that's especially for nitro beers. That's Adam. But they haven't got that to work Adam. yet because for it to work, they have to have some keg. Jacks to yeah. Sure, sure. But for that to work, they have to get uh, kegs with a uh, beer that doesn't have any carbonation in it, because they have the nitro whatever thing themselves. So they get a keg without carbonation, they can do it nitro style. Wow, and, cool. Okay. But other than that, they have a rotating selection of 20 beers uh, on tap, and the cool thing is like they've only been open for they've been open since like September. And they've already had like a ton of different events. Like this past weekend, I went to an event called Beer Geek Madness, where they had McKellar Beer Geek Vanilla Shake, Beer Geek Coca Shake, McKellar Beer Geek Brunch Weasel, uh, McKellar uh, Beer Geek Breakfast, and uh, what was the la- uh, McKellar Beer Geek like Breakfast? Heaven, man. <laughs> yeah, 
I'm, I'm getting so poor on the student budget because of this place. <laughs> but no, that was, sounds awesome. But it was awesome. And I tried doing some blending. I tried blending uh, Coca Shake and Vanilla Shake. <laughs> and, oh, uh, man. That was insane. And then I tried I blending uh, Figgy Brunch Weasel and Vanilla Shake. It was pretty fucking epic. <laughs> coffee, and coffee and vanilla. Wow, I can't yeah. even imagine what that'd be like. But both awesome beers. Both blew me away last year. So yeah, definitely, I can imagine. Um, do you think that we'll get bottles of the Beer Geek Speedway over here? No, because it was a brewery only in San Diego. So we're not even going to get it Denmark. in Denmark. Ah, right. Okay. If we're lucky. We're is gonna it, put it on McKellar's yeah, web shop, them, but it's probably gonna cost it's not really that one. an amount of money. Not really. Well, that's interesting because I think I think um, it, it, sounds like, it sounds like it sounds like Denmark's not too really similar to uh, England in terms of the beer scene. Um, London centric, obviously. There's there's loads of craft beer bars in London. Um, there's hot spots, so Leeds is good, York's good, Manchester's good. The bigger cities tend to have decent enough bars in, right? Um, and as it kind of disseminates out into the, the, the smaller areas, um, you kind of get less and less and less stuff available in terms of crafty stuff. Obviously, kind of traditional yeah. beer. Um, Same here. Put in all of that. Yeah, so it doesn't sound too dissimilar, really. Um, I mean, co I'm a, from my experience as a Copenhagen, it's just an absolute bliss. I just, oh, yeah. It's crazy. But then again, I guess London is, but because London's London and it's English, I guess I'm sure it's what used to it, right? But the, the thing that is here in Denmark, we, uh, it's, it, the fun thing about it is like Denmark, UK has a big brewing tradition of brewing all your uh, different ESBs or bitters and stuff like that. Denmark, did have a brewing tradition, but it all came to a halt when the Industrial Revolution started. Because all of a sudden, beer like Carlsberg was readily available, and you didn't have to brew beer on your farms and stuff. So um, we had some inspiration from the UK and stuff, but for a long time, it was just kind of mass-produced lagers. Uh, so like when you go to a traditional kind of Danish bar, you will only find like lagers and stuff. Uh, and maybe whatever Carlsberg imports. And um, then brewery-wise, like most of the craft breweries are centered in Copenhagen, and then we have some in on Funen, and then some scattered around Jutland. But um, the biggest concentration of brewers and uh, different types of beers is definitely Copenhagen compared to anywhere else in Denmark. Just out of interest, have you had anything by, forgive the pronunciation, uh, Borgadal? Or B over the line. Yeah, uh, yeah. day Boogadale. There we go. Thank you. Because <laughs> they, I just picked up a bottle of those because it looked funky when I was over there, uh, and then found out the kind of story behind them. And they are a traditional sort of farmhouse brewery, if I remember rightly. And they've got like a bull's head copper or something like the, the yeah, copper yeah. Bull here, shaped of bull's head. Uh, <coughs> uh, interesting guy. Um, but it, uh, they said they were doing much more kind of traditional Danish style of brewing. Um, yeah, yeah what's your opinion on them, I guess? Yeah. Uh, I, I actually only had one be one or two beers from them. Uh, <coughs> the we see a lot in my region of Denmark, uh, so I haven't had much of it. But once in a while, they're here. But it's not a brewery I really go out of my way to get. Uh, yeah. Because mainly the stuff I had has, hasn't been like anything. I personally have like thought, wow, this is amazing. It's been good, but... Uh, nothing I like. Wow, this is. I need to get more boo day. But they're they are quite popular among some people here. Cool. Uh, but we have they actually have a few breweries trying to uh, recreate beers that were made in Denmark before the whole industrial uh, industrialization thing. Trying to make like <coughs> beers that would traditionally be brewed in farms in Denmark. Because we do have a brewing tradition. It was just kind of. It kind of faded out with the years and the mm. popularity of, and growth of in, in, industrial brewing. So we have some brewers, for example, a uh, beer here makes a uh, traditional Danish or in, traditional inspired oh, Danish Gottöl, uh, which means good beer. It was a style brewed at uh, farms that would be brewed for special occasions, <coughs> parties, and, stuff, and then kept for that. And he actually makes it's called Nordic Rye. It's inspired by a Danish gutter, which is pretty cool, I think. That's nice. Cool. 
that's also a thing I thought. What do you guys think of like uh, the traditional type beers, uh, or some sites call it traditional ales that are like revived versions of extinct beer styles? Well, uh, the head brewer from 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 Atom, Marco, he's uh, he's actually Finnish, um, and he he absolutely adores sati, the the rye juniper twig and and uh, spruce tips. Yeah. So indigenous beer to, so I don't know if De it's the same in Denmark but, but particularly Finland I believe um, and uh, we, we're planning on doing like a, a, a rye wine yeah. aged with juniper berries and, and it's kind of like a, a homage to it um, right. and we, we also do we've also got we do two different types of medieval groots at the brewery we do a, a, a dark one with uh, cardamom coriander for flavouring, and we also do um, uh, chamomile. It's it's like a blonde, an unhopped blonde with chamomile, um, for a bit of fun. So actually, I'm quite I quite like the stars because they they're, they're interesting to give it a little bit of sideways try to. What's unfortunate is they're probably not understood as much outside of people who aren't going to explain it to them. So like this beer is like it tastes like diet coke or like Dr Pepper or something. It's like that's because it's got no hops in it. <laughs> you feel like such a douche by kind of telling people. Uh, actually, this beer is uh, it's really geeky. It's middle of a group. Yeah, you just wouldn't understand it. But I quite like them as a style, and I, I actively explore them in my own brewing. So well, I guess it's um. It's a funny one, really, because th those kind of extinct styles have become, become the kind of the the, the 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 parlance of the ridiculous craft beer, kind of like yeah, angles, really. Yeah, cool. It's kind of like the beer that the beer that um, Jack was drinking out of. The, I don't know if he's still, still drinking out of the growler. Um, could any there's there's certain kind of like elements of the kind of beer world in the UK, which which the beer that Zach, that Jack has got. Will annoy the house of them to an uh, nth degree, really. It, 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 what, what is it again? Uh, this is a <laughs> right. <laughs> this is a collaboration with uh, Elixir from Edinburgh. Um, ben is the most crazy man. He'll put anything in beer. This is a Chipotle and, and smoked lemon thyme stout porter. Uh, porter, yeah, definitely porter. Exactly. It's, it's the kind of like. Sorry, black, black goes with this and that and other. I mean, people people are kind of like, oh well, what's wrong with it tasting the beer? <laughs> what is going on over there? <laughs> is it I can't even hear anything but Stuart and everyone. <laughs> Andrew emptying his nose. Oh, Andrew then. That's Andrew. <laughs> Go down the street, lads. <laughs> Oh, Stuart, I want to find that. That's dudes. <laughs> Crazy dudes. Something's happening over there, at least. They're both ill. They're both ill. <laughs> they're both Ill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you all right? Boys. <coughs> too, much, too, too much of the good life. <laughs> I've got a soft throat, so I can't talk that much. That's what um, kind of lots of lots of cask ale and so sausage sandwiches gets you. <laughs> <laughs> a bad cold, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say it earlier, but I've I, I got my voice. I'm surprised Tim and Taylor hasn't canned their landlord yet. Yeah, you mean, as a big brewery? It's, it, yeah, why haven't they? It's a funny one. I mean, you can get bottles of it. I think, I think bottles, I mean, weirdly, bottles of landlord was, were, was one of my earlier kind of British... Traditional yeah. beers. Yeah. So when I when I got into beer, it was more kind of um, German and uh, Belgian and, and and the early American stuff. Yeah. My 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 sister-in-law. Well, my she wasn't my sister-in-law at the time, but um, she bought me a box of beers from Beers of Europe, like Beers of the World, and a bottle of Landlord were in there, and I was like, never had that free bottle. Give it a go. And it, I I quite liked it. It was it was a bit of an awakening, really. <coughs> Um, so I mean, when, when, it, when it's on form, it's really good. But it's sometimes bloody hell. I mean, it's because it's, it's sold so many places that I guess that's one of the issues with beers that become popular. Um, they get put in a lot of places, and then the amount of places that can serve, especially a cask ale, to a, yeah. to a decent quality. Of, I mean, it's it's far, few and far between, which is. 
I guess is, this is a, this brings me back to something slightly odd. The the, the opening of Bradford Brewery last night, their ke- their keg selection was terrible, and it's they must have some tie-in to some bigger breweries because the, all they had on was Sagres, Amstel. They had something from Caledonia. They had um, something from Salter, and it, it was a really for a new place. Their keg selection was terrible, but their cast selection was fantastic, and it was absolutely spot on. There's some from Bad Seed, which is really nice. Siren, Handra Monkey, all in absolutely stonking form. But as as a kind of like a more modern place, place for kind of like aimed at a younger audience, um, the keg selection was beyond shite, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for it, because it's in because the record cafe is just open, Sparrow Cafe is in town. I mean, those two do an amazing selection of keg and cask, so it's, it's uh, they'll need to be careful with that because they'll might lose might lose some fans to, uh, and they're only up the road as well. Yeah, yeah, nice place. I mean, good people. I mean, I'm, I hope I want them to um, succeed, but you I mean I just find it a bizarre choice. There must be some. There must be. In with, I'm going to ask you next time I see him. Mm. Must be some deal that they've like Caledonian have um, installed their um, their bar or their cellar or something. There's something going something going on there. There's a lot of that goes on from what I make what I, what I hear. It's like a bigger brewery will um, set up your bar, set up your cellar in um, uh, in response to you having like two of their beers on permanently for like six months. That's the same. <laughs> It's illegal in America, though. Illegal in America, and uh, Is it? Sam, yeah, Sam Smith. Uh, sorry, Samuel Adams has been. Um, do you remember there was that article about Sam Adams where, where they kind of portrayed him, um, Jim Cock, as going a bit off the walls and a bit mm. mental. Um, that in there, they said that he got accused of doing that, of um, installing cellars and and, and uh, buying out permanent taps, essentially. Um, I believe over there it's not allowed, yeah. Which clearly it is here and in Denmark. It's very complicated. Actually, yeah. actually, here, if you open a new bar, and, uh, if you're kind of successful or whatnot, uh, and Carlsberg gets a wind of it, or and it, not necessarily if you're successful, but they catch you the wind of it, maybe you've got some shit going where people heard about you online, whatnot. Uh, Sometimes they'll say, "Hey, uh, we're going to offer you an entire drive, uh, draft system uh, that you can borrow as long as you serve our core range of beers permanently." Yeah, that, uh, that that happens to some places here, and some places say, "Yeah," and then they have the core range of Carlsberg and then serve some other stuff. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's it's a funny old situation. It's like um, the Sparrow, for example. I mean. Um, their, their their lager is Bernard, which is a very good Czech pilsner. But um, the the people who installed their their cellar and their their taps are the are the the importers of that beer. I mean, that's a good example of the deal going well. I guess you've got a serve lager, so it may as well be a good one. But then there's another pub down road from me, and apparently whoever owns two bog is it Carlsberg or anything. Carlsberg. Well, yeah, so sure, I'll know by the name of the Fox. When the Fox <coughs> was open, they had a, they had a free house, formerly connected to a very small local brewery. You go in there, they've got local cascades on, and then a, a, a two bog. <laughs> I know you've got to have a lager on, because a lot of people will still live in lager, so fair enough. You've got to make money, it's a, it's a money making endeavour, despite how we may see it as a, a, bit, more of an, a bit more than that. Um, but may as well be good, isn't it? Really, I mean, <laughs> yeah. sell lager, sell a good lager. Hey, we don't sell lager. We don't sell lager in my couple. Oh really? Nope. Not a single one. Do you sell what bar in a weak area of the town? You make sure you you sell strong because it, 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 it if you sell strong, it feeds off to the lower ends like the the bi. The Aegis, uh, Star, the Castle. If you sell strong, it feeds out to the other pubs. Yeah. Now, if you sell weak, like you said, Rob, you went last night, the keg line was poor, and yeah. a lot of these students 
if it's not strong when they arrive, yeah. they won't repeat their business. I completely agree. Bloody students. You've got to make you've got to make yeah, you've got to make a good first impression. And it it, yeah. it, it seemed weird to me. You I mean yeah, we can go down all obviously you must you won't know these pubs but <coughs> you mentioned. But there, you mean you can go there and buy buy a pint of lager, a pint of Guinness, the same old shit. Every all of them have got the same old thing. So mm. why open a new place and just put same old stuff? Media, Stargaz and I'm still in it. Don't make any sense. That, the people who go there will be like, how much? And we've seen in many places that open up week and then yeah. end up having no ales on the following yeah. couple of months because no one turns up. Yeah, and then they close down in six months. Yes. <laughs> but I can see how it, like, you need to have a, a beer <coughs> that everyone can drink, um, like a lager or something. Like basement beer bar here. They have a, a house lager. It's called Basement Beer Bar Lager or something like it. A beer that they've had specially made for, for them by a Danish craft brewery that they often sell beer from called Ugly Duck slash Inslu. Oh, yeah. And uh, they make, uh, they have the line of beers called Inslu Wakuts, which is basic, uh, basically wheat beers, mainly wheat beers. And then they have a craft line called Ugly Duck, which makes all kinds of uh, beers and Probably some of the best, uh, really affordable craft here in Denmark. But uh, it's basically if a, a number of pubs in the area buy, get a local brewery to produce a lager, and then buy up as much as they can and split out the casks of the lager, that cuts down the cost. So basically, they can produce a local produced lager, and mm -hmm. it, it appeals to the lager drinker, it appeals to the ale drinker because it's a craft lager rather than a lager. Mm -hmm. See, that, that brings me, that, that kind of like sparks some interesting point. Is a lager drinker interested in, in, in interested in <coughs> an interesting lager? Or well, is that's it not part, really it brand, re brand rec uh, recognition? You mean right. brand well, loyalty, things like that? Oh, well, I know. We, don't, we don't. We don't serve lagers. We don't serve lager in the micro pub. That's that's a key decision we made. Is that we only serve real ale, real cider, and some wine. There's no spirits or anything like that as well. It's just. Um, it's just is what it is, and um, it kind of differentiates us from the rest of the crowd in in, in town in Beverly. Um, so, uh, do we have an issue? No, rarely. Really rarely. If people come in and there's a group of people that come in, they know that we do real ale. They expect it. We're just slightly off kind of from the beaten track. Um, and when we do get the occasional person who wants it, they kind of like you know they kind of look behind you at the bottle bar behind you like what, what, what do they do? They must they must have they must have a lager somewhere. Um, and we end up either selling them a bottle of cold, fizzy but tasteful pale ale. Or they try kind of what's the lightest pale ale on on on, on tap, and more often than not, it's, and sometimes hilariously so, they like they really quite enjoy, I guess, some of the, the most entry level and easy going um, pale ales, and they're like, wow, I never tried Casper I've liked before. It's like, well, they're just <laughs> yeah, brand recognition and <laughs> yeah, and, that's that's, and that's, that's mostly done for happy accident. Yeah, yeah, fine, happy accident. But it, it, it's quite fun to see, and it's quite fun to like yeah. not offer the alternative, but have an alternative beer on the bar, mm -hmm. like an easy-going pale ale that's just suppable, really suppable, yeah. typically British, shall we say. Like, that's just one anecdote from my, from my side, what, what happens in, in yeah. our place. But we're not in a big city, so we might not have the same humongous well, issue. Because of Todmorden and the Mason Harms in Todmorden, they, they, they sell a local organic lager on their bar. Over a normal Carlsberg or stuff like that, and it's basically they're supporting local, they're supporting lager drinkers, and they're mm. supporting craft beer drinkers it, by doing that. And that small pub in a small place in a small place called Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Adam's gonna show off, so uh, <laughs> letting them kind of like depart. Always a pleasure, pleasure guys. Is... Next month yeah, I'll mention my doing that. I'm going to work in the morning. So <laughs> next time he's going to get up. Some people are going to work in the morning, so I don't I'll need to. I'll put my voice up in the morning. And I'm just being a set. And I've got a bottle of, I've just opened a bottle of 
and found his imperial stance. So I'm gonna be oh, able to beautiful it. stuff. Beautiful stuff. I'm jealous. <laughs> I just opened a, a newly released locally brewed IPA. Ooh. Awesome. And uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Alright guys, see you later. See you later. Bye. Bye. See you later guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's. But talking about uh, uh, having to have like or uh, having a uh, lager on a craft lager, uh, I think the main reason why this place, a basement, has a craft lager is because first of all, they don't want to sell the mass-produced stuff because they're trying to, you know, get away from that. And then because my city in, is uh, known for partying, uh, it is kind of weird. But the city I live in. The Aalborg is basically known all around Denmark for a place called Jomfruenegel, which is a street just with clubs, like, all the way down. And uh, we get so many young people touristing here in the summer and all just to go there and get hammered and party. And, yeah. like, they want to get some revenue from them as well. They're kind of – they're not really super close to the place, but uh, they kind of need to have something like a, a, a regular – semi-regular lager on tap as well because I mean, yeah something that the masses can drink, you know because I, there's a lot of people who come into the bar it's just a different product yeah, it's just a, a lot of people come in there and then they're not too into maybe different beers but then there's a, like a safe fit for them because they still want to check it out because it's a new place and it's a unique looking yeah. you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you live in a place where there's beers from all over the world in your fingertips. The problem is, a lot of beers drain you physically because a lot of them are big beers and, like, tiring. Yeah. Whereas lager is more regenerating, almost. No, see, I, I, I can't drink much lager at all. I mean, a uh, pint and a half, and I'm, I'm done. I mean, it's just so gassy. Yeah, I just yeah, like, oh, I mean, it's just like, oh, I, lay, I, I just want to lay down. I mean, we, we, a couple of years ago, <laughs> when the Big Brothers Conference was in um, in Leeds, um, I mean, Simon came up to that as well. Um, and Pilsner Raquel put on a on a, a fantastic night in like the most expensive um, restaurant in Leeds. They, they took over it for about goodness knows how much they cost that cost. But it was it was it was it was it was, it was, it was flowing. The Pilsner Raquel was flowing. They, they were tapping kind of like the unfiltered. They were just like um, it's like these these kind of like spikes of. Fresh pretzels everywhere. It was incredible. It was, a, it was a wonderful time. Apart from when the men had put on like party hats and um, um, polo shirts that sit on the back. I'm a thirsty beer blogger. I still I do still own that t t t shirt. Uh, but um, but after like about a pint and a half, I mean, and it's a lovely pilsner. I mean, it's it's when it's on the form, it's it's decent stuff. And um, but after a pint and a half of that, I was like, oh man. Uh, sure. Could get comfortable. I think also, like the different, the, the biggest reason why people also will opt for the lager in a place like that here is to just because Denmark and if you in Scandinavia in general is fucking <laughs> expensive. So if you're gonna get anything other than the craft lager, you're gonna have to pay off at a at one of these craft beer bars because it is just so expensive. When, when I go out, if I go out to party with friends and stuff. I'll maybe have two, three craft beers, and then I'll turn to something else because I can't afford it. I'm used to paying, like, I don't know how much it is in pounds, but for, like, a, a bottle of a, a craft beer, a Danish craft beer, if it's a, a 33 centiliter bottles, it's, it's like 35, 40 kroners, which is... Well, four or five pounds. Yeah, four or five pounds, something like that. It's, it's, it's expensive here, and that's for something that's just like a pay layoff. When you get, yeah, when you get like it's not when, you buy, uh, when, when you buy a Danish like imperial stout, it's uh, 100 kroners plus usually if it's like barrel aged and stuff probably, but probably 70 to 100 kroners if it's from one of the more well known breweries. It's I'd say I mean uh, I know Jack were in Copenhagen last year. Yeah. Um. So obviously you're very much like part part of the, the slightly. <laughs> snazzier end of 
the UK beer scene as well. Um, things are expensive here, really are. I mean, I can't. Yeah. I mean, when me and um, me and Adam had a bottle of um, um, young milk, um, the way I know it's important, but you know, it's not coming coming that far. Um, I think that cost us the best part of like. About a tenner, eleven quid, something like that. So that's probably about hundred and fifty Danish krona, something like that. It's a little bit more expensive than you probably pay over there. I mean, it's not cheap. It's not cheap over here at all. I mean, a, a pint of a pint of like a seven percent IPA over here, five six pound. But but I'm talking like uh, bottles at supermarkets. Oh, at supermarkets, okay. Uh, like I like sometimes. When I hear reviews from you guys in the UK and stuff, you talk about you pay, uh, pay uh, two pound fifty for a bottle of something. Here it's expensive as fuck for bottled stuff in stores as well. <laughs> I mean, it's it's insane some of the prices, and uh, I think a lot of uh, companies who sell beer has found out that it's getting so popular that they can actually amp up the prices a little bit more and get a bigger revenue themselves because it seems like the prices has been rising a lot for the last few six months here. Well, uh, anecdotally, we we got a guy who came to see us and he said, uh, I, was in a, I was in a bar in Sheffield the other day and saw one of your bottles of beer there. I said, oh, that's really cool. It's nice to see our stuff's there. I said, yeah, there's only one problem. It was at £7.10 a bottle for a pale ale. Right? <laughs> I wouldn't pay three quid. I wouldn't pay three quid for a bottle of our pale ale. I really wouldn't. <laughs> and um, So we kind of traced it back and called the guy up. And the thing is, we sold the case to him for roughly a pound a bottle. So 24 case for 24 quid. 700% profit. Oh, so you can imagine, we've stopped supplying this fellow now. Um, yes. There's no bones about it. We're like, your beer's crafty, so we're selling it at that. It was like, no, mate, no. We don't, give you, we, don't give you, we don't give you that price so you can sell it for £7. We give you that price so you sell it for £3. Like, you're taking a massive cut out of what we could have had. We, we'd have sold it to you £5 a bottle, to be frank, if we thought you were going to sell it yeah. £7 a bottle, right? Um, so I don't think it's uh, necessarily just... I, I know it's more expensive than Denmark. I know it is, but I think prices relative for us are going up as well yeah. some places that are trying to cash in. Not places that actually care, but places that are trying to cash in. So how, what was your experience, though, in, like, in knowing how things are over here? And This is this completely um, like selfish question because I mean, I'm going soon and I want to be prepared. <laughs> so yeah, how is yeah, yeah, it's you go to Bar. When you go to McKellar Bar, when you go to those places, uh, you're gonna if you want to get some of the real cool stuff, you're gonna have to be <coughs> prepared to pay like 60, 70 kroners for a 20 centiliter pour of a beer. Yeah. Yep. What's up, Mr. Stewart? That's like. I'll move it. I think we're gonna see him die on camera. <laughs> No, well, I've been in Sweden later this year, and you're not selling it to me, Peter. <laughs> in Sweden, yeah, even more expensive. Sweden is more expensive, in my opinion. <laughs> Actually, for us Danes, Sweden is cheaper because uh, uh, the Swedish kroner is lower than the Danish one. Oh, but the right. worst place, the worst place is Norway. Mm. Are you fucking kidding me? It's expensive <laughs> there. When I went, uh, I went to Norway this uh, summer. With a Jakob for an event at the uh, and uh, after the event, we went out uh, to a, fe- a small uh, cod festival. It was some <laughs> local festival, fishing festival with band playing and stuff. And we went to get a, uh, a I think it was 33, uh, 33 centiliter pour of um, a uh, Nugnu uh, pale ale, and it was eighty kroners. Uh, per glass for 33 centiliters. So by that water. Is... Huh? By water. <laughs> that is. Uh... Okay, one second. Eight, 80, 83 kronos. It, it, it's like uh, 7 pounds for 33 centiliters of oh, pale yeah. ale on tap in Norway. <laughs> We bought no, one beer, it. and then it's like, okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. 
I, I, we had a few more, but it, it was just it was expensive. Norway is super expensive um, in general. It's probably the most expensive country in uh, in Scandinavia. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely accept. You may expect it. I mean, I do find it kind of weird that I think I guess we find ourselves in in between it all, really, in the UK. In America, it seems really affordable. Kind of really, yeah. high, really good. Craft beer seems to me, uh, and we, a lot of us have been there. So um, you go in those shops and you go, how much? It's like that. That even just like the low end stuff. If you, because like before I go somewhere, I'll be like looking on their online online shop. And, like the cheapest beer will be like a, oh, so that that kind of Dale's Pale Ale is one dollar fifty. I'm like, I pay like five times, <laughs> five times <laughs> the UK for that. And, but but then at the same time, I mean, I mean that. I mean, I know that's an IPA, but that that's three pound. That was three pound ten for a can uh, in America. Seven percent. Yeah, seven point two percent. So a, a, a six pack of American IPA. So High Life, for example, from Sagasi. Um, how much is a six pack of High Life in Denmark? Eight dollars or something. I mean, uh, it'll be like eight dollars, and, and people will be like, "Oh, it's, it was an expensive one." This, I mean, eight dollars for a six pack. <laughs> I was like, "What?" I paid eight quid for a can, you know. <laughs> exactly. The 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 the, the fats are the, the the best example of all that. She's uh, so they'll be like, "Oh yeah, this, this is quite I mean, quite an expensive one. Fifteen dollars for like a like a four pack of this fifteen percent um, imperial stout." Yeah. We probably play four times that for one bottle. Yeah. Actually, I was able to get a good deal on a six pack at one point of Highlight IPA from uh, from Cigar City. Probably not super fresh, but they got them in six packs at a local store, and it was twenty five pounds for six. Wow. That's, wow. that's a significant amount for six. But that was the that was a deal. It was fifty kroners a bar or a can. I, I've seen. I, I know. I'm aware of a shop. I think based in France, who've got some cans of Highlight. And I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how fresh they are. So, so, so. Yeah. That's it. I mean, for me, I, mean, I guess this would be the next, uh, a good question. Import beer. How how often do you buy it? Are you are you becoming? I guess because of your kind of like your increased awareness of things, do you become less um, willing? And as our kind of indigenous basins progress, do you feel less inclined to spend that big money of that import beer, thinking that it might not be that fresh, I mean, or it might not be in that good nick? When when and is it worth the? Because like yesterday, the reason I say this, the guy on, on guy on Twitter. Bought uh, a bottle of, is it Cambridge? I mean, Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, Cambridge. Yeah. yeah. They're, um, I think, is it Red God? Yeah, they were like, like paid oh, like or something. Yeah. Yeah, he paid um, best part of like fourteen quid, I'd say at least, busy year. And I said to him when he, when he posted a picture, I was like, that might you might want to check the bottling date of that because I might be quite old. It, it's as Peter said, really. Um, if you if you buy him, if you buy in a, a hoppy beer from across the pond, I I got um, a total beer actually, um, salt milk, um, yeah. and that that had gone to Shelton Brothers in Massachusetts, <laughs> from Denmark back to Mickley in Denmark, and then to my friend's house in York, and then to me before he got to me. So he'd gone to America, back to Denmark, back to in, well, to England, and then... So, you know, you can never tell with these things. Paying that much for a beer like that, as Peter said, you, unless you're in West Coast West Coast California, or you, you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the tap house, as I have been, you're just not going to be able to guarantee quality. And it's, it's a shame, because people really want to try stuff, right? And, and I, I won't put people off, but, but if you're going to be really spending really mega nice. money, be careful. I'm still going to know this bottle was. Do you know when this bottle was bottled? No, like 2012. 2012. Oh, the bottle that this guy bought. This no, guy, that... bottle this guy bought from Cambridge. Ah, oh, oh, right, from okay. Cambridge, Europe. It was bottled in 2012. And he got it recently. And he, it arrived yesterday. He's he's got he's he's got a an English old ale now. It's but all it's the like, 
And this is this is the issue with imports. I mean, unless you you can guarantee freshness, it it, it well for what it doesn't portray that bit how it should be. I mean, so it's, it's a short change in the people who are producing it, and I mean, and you're you're being fleeced because it's not what it should be as well. And I mean, we're paying over the odds regardless. I mean, thankfully, I think Brewdog are one of the better better sources of imported beer in the UK because the the they, cause they've got. A, They've got a big kind of chain of bars, so they've got buying power and they can bring stuff in. But beyond that, I mean, he's cool. He's old. I, I, still, I still buy a lot of import stuff, though. I mean, uh, bottle shops. The bottle shops should know what they're selling. Yeah. But I don't think they care. Because if, they've if got they don't, they buy it, they've got to sell it. They're, they're, they're selling... Uh, an old product, like you say, a bit an IPA from across the pond. That's an old, old product to a customer that's new to the yeah. craft beer drinking. So it'll it'll think. Then going on, that's what a fresh IPA is supposed to taste like. Yeah. Because you're getting an old IPA rather than a fresh IPA. A lot a lot of websites. They should put a freshness code on their website. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. a backstage, basically five stars, fresh, four stars, going, three stars, and you know, you get the idea. But, the, but the, yeah, but they're, they're, they're losing money. That's, the, that's their bottom line. Yeah, but, no, that, I mean, that also shows the people that buy it should buy it as soon as possible. Because they can see how fresh it is. intelligent decisions, really. I mean, it's like, Peter yeah. used to work in the bottle shop, didn't you? Yeah. It's like, how, how does that work? I mean, because it's like, you've got, you've got, to, you've got to sell what you buy. So you've you lose money. Oh, but, yes! <laughs> going back first before um, you said buying stuff, I, I still buy imports a lot. But just not the hoppy stuff, really. Uh, I don't mind buying the, the Imperial <laughs> What not? It's just it's just the IPAs. I I'm not too keen on buying. Yeah, no. But talking about uh, with the bottle shelf thing and all, you don't get a date with your oh. papers. When you get a list and it's like these beers are available, yeah. which ones do you want to buy for your shop? And then you pick the ones you think will sell or the ones you are interested in. You don't get a brewed on date by the the distributor. You, yeah, just get that, you just get that, uh, like, two pages of paper. This is what we have right now. What do you want to order? Yeah. I mean, when I was in Missouri, um, a lot of the breweries, they were telling me that they didn't have to put ABV on. They didn't have to put dates on them because they want... Don't so like, obliged. Yeah. But they didn't have to... When you should put them on for the customer that's buying your products. I only think that's in the U. I only think that's in the U.S. Thing where you there's some states you don't have to put the ABV and some states you don't have to put a, a date on and whatnot. But here you have to put an expiration date on, and that's a expiration date according to when the beer is going to go bad, not freshness yeah. of hops or anything. And that's like a legal thing. So that's how it is here, at least. Yeah, I think it's the same in England. Yeah. yeah, I think every brewery should put an ABV on all their beers because they don't know what that person is going to drink their beer. They don't know if they're going to drink it in the afternoon, they don't know if they're going to drink early evening, suddenly late evening. If yeah, they don't yeah. put the ABV on, the person that drinks that beer thinking, oh, I'll be able to drink that. He'll <laughs> drink that beer, and it'll be like 12%, but he'll think, he won't know it's 12%. Yeah. And then he'll drink it, go out, and then be like, "What the fuck happened to me?" <laughs> I've, I've got a friend who's he, he's, he's from England. He's, he's lived in um, <coughs> um, um, Northern Illinois for um, best part of twenty years now. I mean, um, and he, he always said that that happens because Americans, if they know it's it's really strong, they'll drink it. They'll, they'll go for the strong ones. <laughs> It's just the mentality, so so that's why they don't put the ABV, ABV on them. The ones I, I picked out on this were because they were one of the earlier ones at the time. It was Rogue, 
And, and when you bought them in yes. the UK in, from certain shops, uh, they're, they're right on the ABV, like a chalk marker. <laughs> like, 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 but Lee, Lee said, I mean, a lot of time it is, it's, it's six packs and the ABV is on six packs and all that business, fair enough. But then there's like bombers with, with no ABV on it. It's, but he says, I guess Americans will just go for the strong stuff. Funny story, though, now you mentioned Rogue. The beer store I used to work at actually was the European importer of both Rogue and Unibrew at one point. Oh, oh wow. Cool. But uh, it got too expensive for them, so they stopped. And then, unfortunately, last year they closed down because we didn't have enough <coughs> in my city. It sucks. But, oh, no, it really sucks, yeah. So you need to open a new ball shop here. <laughs> right. Actually, my... On, my the ball- back of, on the back of the success of your canning line business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start getting my first canning craft brewery and all the ball shop. <laughs> Traveling, yeah, yeah, mobile canning unit. It's, as I was saying at the start, I mean, that is where money is. It is. Yeah, you'll make a packet. In a year's time, we'll, yeah, be, yeah. we'll be on this broadcast and you'll be like in a golden throne. Made of, oh, made I have of like gold <laughs> rings and then like, <laughs> rings and like what's yeah. up, boys? With like a, a solid gold can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And a big solid gold cup, like a goblin. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it's all about it, it really sucked that that store closed down though, because it was it had a great selection. It and it's like it started in two thousand five or six, I think. The old place, and like they got nominated by Rape Beer so many times for best bottle shop in Europe, and then it had oh, to well. go down. It, it really sucked. <laughs> hmm. But, uh, yeah, he tried to sell it. No one was interested in buying. Cause yep. it, mm. it was kind of like a thing. It was kind of like a... Um, um, you didn't get paid to work there, did, nope. did you? Like a volunteer uh, scheme and stuff? They tried the first two years of business uh, paying him, the owner. Or There are there a few owners, but uh, my boss who was the guy who worked there the most. Or he had in, At first, he had to get... a. Uh, full salary and then they pop, tried to pay the rest but they quickly found out that they could only afford to pay salary for uh, like him <laughs> and the rest would be investors and uh, to, he uh, couldn't uh, run the store just on that salary because that store basically you know the money they spent on beer or they, they sold beer they spent on new bottles so it's just like it, they didn't get any commission in the, in the thing so so they had to hire people who actually wanted to work there for free, and then their payment would be a, a very good discount on beers. And then, like, he wouldn't get mad when you're done with work if you cracked a beer from the store or whatnot. So, yeah, I worked there for, for free, and everyone else in there did as well. Yeah. It sounds like a great thing, but you mean... It was really cool. We got a very <laughs> cool uh, uh, community, and like, I got some cool friendships out of it as well. But that's quite endemic of the brewing industry in general, because I don't make any money out of the brewing process. I work, I work all my money pretty much I earn from working in the pub. Um, so brew for the sake of it, because I enjoy it, right? Um, yeah. there, there's only there's there's five people who work at Atom. One person has a salary, uh, and even he's on minimum wage. The rest of us all just kind of like get pittances. I get like a hundred quid in my bank account randomly, and I'm like, oh, that's money from work from from the, from the brewery, right? <laughs> Um, the rest okay, of the case of beer every month. No, not even that. Not balls. Not balls. Really? I, just, I occasionally get to take growlers straight from the tank. Yeah. <laughs> when they're not looking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they saw me, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd be in trouble. No, but you do it for the love of it sometimes, don't you? Exactly. And that's uh, the only way the scene will get better. I'm, I'm sure there's there's loads of people like me and like Peter and like well, like all of us. Let's be honest, who do a lot of stuff for the scene without ever wanting anything back from potentially back from the scene, and that's that's great. Uh, long may it live. Uh, but eventually, uh, eventually I'll need to <laughs> I need to make money eventually, please. <laughs> Absolutely. When, when you're up in your own brewery, come on, come on. Everybody's opening opening a brewery. Yeah, but then I'll let people less Most brewery. people who shouldn't be opening a brewery don't yeah. a brewery. It's I'm nice to uh, see that East Yorkshire is actually producing a lot of breweries now. Uh, 
Not, of, not, not to my knowledge. Ooh. What's Marvin that? Marvin Campbell. Is that uh, six Marvel six? Yeah, uh, off the top of my head, yeah. But but um, ask me in another year, and we'll see how many are around. To be honest, uh, I think there's a few that have set off off the ground, but um, it's 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 tough in this area, and and um, they're going to find it real difficult. I'm afraid, and I, I wish them the best of luck, but some of them are just tanking at the moment, and it's so sad to see. But who knows, who knows? There's a few that are doing all right. Sorry, I pessimism really, of the day over. <laughs> I, I, really, I, really was, I really wanted to end on your, your point then, um, before we before you got slightly melancholic. Mm, sorry. Uh, so yeah. It was really kind of like oh. triumphant, and like... We were all doing. We, I mean, we were all doing this for the right reasons. Yeah, craft beer. But because you went downhill afterwards, we're gonna stay yeah. on longer, <laughs> and you can't go either. So we're gonna stay on until we've got a moment, and then we'll stop. Okay. All right. Well, as I was saying, <laughs> the craft beer industry is a fantastic thing. We all help each other. No, right? no, 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 no! Don't fake it. Don't fake it. Don't be fake it. <laughs> I'm being genuine, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't fake it and get like an, an ending now. It's, it's a beautiful moment. A beautiful moment, though. You know. Anyway, no, but I completely agree. I mean, I mean, uh, I know Peter's done stuff. I mean, I've done. I'm, I'm trying to do more. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting out there doing a bit, bits and bats. I'm not, I'm not doing it for um, to make any money. I mean, I'm, I'm covering costs. That's all I want to do. Oh, it's all about for me. It's about community. I want, I want people to do like fun mm. things. I want to. I think beer brings people together. Beer has brought these people together. I mean, this is why I know you guys, and I think it's a really cool thing. So I mean, we we should all do more of it because there's a lot of a lot of kind of like nasty stuff going on, even within this little kind of like microcosm. Because yeah. existing, so, uh, in, in general, it's a real friendly, happy, fun oh, it's fantastic. environment. Um, I mean, yeah. we're running a beer school. We, I, I run a beer school at Atom as well, so not only do I work there occasionally, I also do a nighttime school for, for people who really want to get into the industry or, or want to get really good at home brewing or whatever. Um, and it's an eight week long course, and do you know, I've made, I've made some fantastic. Afternoon. Sorry, Stu? Afternoon. Uh, Tony, yeah, Tony from Alphamoon's Wonderful Chap, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the one I want to mention. Uh, is he North Yorkshire? Oh, it's on the board. It's New York, anyway. Um, sorry, what was I saying? Yeah, so we've got this beer school, and, and, and I've made some absolutely fantastic friends out of that. I mean, like, in a city of Hull where there's, there's about four free houses in the entire city where we can sell beer, the brewery that's yeah. based in Hull, right? Yeah, that's um, crazy. And, and to see there's actually there's, there's this undercurrent of people who are genuinely interested. One of them's going to open a bar really soon in Hessel, a, a completely free craft beer bar. Brilliant. There's another guy who's um, going to try and open a homebrew store in the city. Fantastic. So already, just from kind of links... Um, uh, not just from the back of me, but but uh, linking these people together, it's it's fantastic. The beer community is a wonderful community because we're all passionate about something. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, I really love the community. Commu community, that's what I love about it. You meet so many cool people through it. I've met so many cool people through just doing YouTube and just you know traveling and doing you know trying different beers and sit at a bar, talk to a random guy and whatever. I mean. It's just like it's a cool community and it's it's a cool way to meet people as well. I mean, I haven't met many people in craft beer that's been dickheads. There's been a few, but mostly I think craft beer people are good people, which is awesome. And it's always nice to meet you know meet good people. That's that's one of the reasons why I love doing also the whole YouTube thing because you get to meet so many new people and you know do something like this, which is yeah, lots exactly. of fun. Yeah. yeah. At least you'll have to be fun, but <laughs> yeah. Cool. Harry, would you like to chip in? Um yeah. So, I just thought you mean, I mean, I guess you you mean you you came into this like little little kind of group because I mean via Stu, Stu's is the, the intrepid beer traveller that he is. I mean uh, Yeah, I, I mean I think Stu was the kind of what the person who introduced me to all of the various groups on Facebook, got to meet various other people um, in my local area as well as I'm on like a craft beer island and there's no one really else 
round here that I know. I mean, now I've spoken to the people from Sadler's Brewery. It's not well, not craft beer essentially, but but it's still it's still good to speak to different breweries <coughs> and kind of oh, yeah. explore into well now we, yeah, but that to kind of explore all the different beers and and and, and it's not fair. I want to meet some more people around here. Hopefully, mm. there will be one sometime. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. I really am. There will be people passionate. Your area is historically very important for breweries. There must be people who are... It's well, a shame I, that the links aren't there now. But This, this was a uh, thing I wanted to raise uh, uh, this beer chat. But because my throat was hurting, I couldn't really talk. Um, that the fact that a lot of old-style breweries are now embracing craft beer uh, development, like Sadler's, like... But, uh, <clears throat> drinking, do embrace it, but in the wrong way, but still embrace it. Mm, I, I just wanted to add, I'm, I'm going on a brewing course uh, on the 6th, or 4th, 5th, 6th of uh, March, and it's with Purity Brewing. Um, if you know them, yeah. Um, so I'll be I'll be looking forward to doing that. But I'm also going the following week. We've got a tasting session at my new local uh, bottle shop with uh, people from Backyard Brewery, which is a Walsall base, which is like ten minutes away from me. So um, just looking forward to trying local beers. I'm trying to try all, all of their beers before I before I actually go and work with them and uh, do little bits with them. But it's um it's it's quite <coughs> exciting to see how the uh, craft beer is kind of movement is is kind of picking up a little yeah. bit here. It's uh, it's taken some time, uh, no doubt it's taken some time, and we've only got really one craft beer or bar. We've only got really got Brewdog in in Birmingham that's mm -hmm. of any note. I, I suppose we've got post office vaults and mm. various other uh, pubs within the city, but there's only really one decent place I know at the moment. So it's kind of exciting at the moment. I like the way that things are going in my city, but I'm envious of the north. Well, we'll keep, just keep, keep in mind that we're, we're at the start of a crest of a wave, really, and it's yeah. only going to pick up from here. Um, it, uh, the, I mean, there wasn't so long ago that I remember Leeds not be, being an absolute barren, sparse wasteland for it, and now it we're in the space of a while. Well, go back five years ago, and London wasn't very good. Yeah, go back, go back, look it up. And now, like, every, like, every phone box in London has been taken over by a Dano brewery. We're making, making murky looking IPA. Do you know what? That, that, is, that is a segment of the craft beer market that's not been tapped yet. Come on, we need some gravity brain through. <laughs> phone box. Has it happened in Basically, uh, old, school old school breweries embracing. The craft beer culture. What do you say, Stu? Old school breweries embracing the, the craft beer culture. Yeah, like this one. The one I talked about. It's an okay local IPA. Um, this brewery does mainly lagers, but they're kind of embracing it by making something like this. This and. I mean, Carlsberg for a long time has had a range called Jakobsen, Jakobsen. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, crafty or it is technically crafty. It's made in a smaller oh, system. <laughs> I didn't say it was good, but it's, it's, it's terrible. Kind of, I mean, some of it is actually okay. I had their mermaid porter a uh, uh, few years ago or so. Has uh, the barley wine? Uh, 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 Baltic porter. <laughs> uh, yeah, trying. But but yeah, trying. But oh, they're trying, and I don't know if they're just doing it to cash in or whatnot. But a lot of people gave give Carlsberg a lot of crap, but don't give him too much crap because Carlsberg, for example, was one of the breweries in Denmark who kept tradition of anything other than pale lager alive while yeah. they were one of the big giants. Because uh, even though it was a beer desert at one point here, and you can mostly only get Pale lagers. Carlsberg still kept brewing, uh, for example, Vipo yeah. Imperial Porter, which was a, a Baltic porter. That was, it's, it's still awesome. Uh, they still kept traditions like that alive. A lot of people just have an idea of pinpointing Carlsberg for only making shitty craft beer. Or craft beer, sorry, uh, shitty macro beer. But historically, well, you have to realize they've done some because Carlsberg is a bigger engine, it takes longer for them to turn around. Than a, a smaller engine like uh, Tuhul and yeah. you know, 
there's not that but small. They can turn around easier all these different beers and then more on the palate. Whereas Carlsberg, because they've got to produce all these mass beers to the market, they try to appeal to the smaller market as well. But because they've got a longer way to turn around because they're a bigger. Yeah, it's it's like think, an it's like an ocean liner and a speedboat. And yeah. I, mean, it's like I, I don't necessarily agree. Way. Actually, I don't necessarily agree. I've seen um, a lot of English bigger brewers. They they because they've got a lot of money behind them as well, a lot of more disposable income, they will set up a brewery, buy out a smaller brewery, put in <coughs> a set of brewers and let them go at it. Uh, usually, do a really bad job, a really, do a really bad job of it, like Masters. Yeah, yeah, you usually do a bad job, but then there's examples of ones to do a good job. So, uh, Eki Skada Grimson from, from Iceland, bad pronunciation, I've got the Borg Brewery, the Borg Brukus, um, okay. which is uh, the, the, the massive kit goes all the way around the building and in the center is this small production 10 barrel kit in the middle and they produce some amazing beers uh, I mean in, uh, there's only like three independent breweries maybe four or five in, in Iceland so I mean it's a microcosm 300,000 people 300,000 people in, yeah. on an island but it's just an example of how one big big brewery has done a good job they their yeah. breweries essentially that's their playground they genuinely these breweries are very skilled and they let them just go to town producing sheep dung ipas and yeah, yeah I mean, crazy stuff the big brewers seem like easy targets and they are for crappier people and talking about the making shit but just <coughs> some of them at least deserve some credit I oh mean, yeah don't be all. The, I mean, the last I, I haven't had it yet, but Carlsberg at least tries. They released not too long ago. Uh, they they started a limited series with their Jakobs and stuff, which again hit and miss, may, often hit uh, miss. Uh, but but they they made a new one, which was a coffee uh, mint chocolate stout. Wow. I haven't tried it, but it's affordable and yeah, you know. It's like forty or sixty kroner. Yeah, fine. Yeah. So. But, <laughs> but then again, they make something like their Brewmaster series, which is just. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of difficult, I reckon. Uh, yeah, like you say, it's not easy for a bigger brewery. It's been set in the ways to to do it, but it's possible. And like you say, that they, they they're big for a reason. Almost, they were the, the the champions of the industry for a long time, and, and unfortunately, some of them have lost the ways to corporatism these days. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a shame, and and it'll it'll it'll, uh, it'll disseminate out. And I hope some of these giants don't completely fall apart because there's a lot of people who work there, a lot of people who are connected to these these big brewing families for years and generations. Um, <laughs> and, and we've still got to thank places like Budweiser uh, uh, for, for keeping places like Goose Island in abundance of barrels so they can continue producing amazing stouts, right? Uh, Mitch, you used to work at Budweiser. Yeah. Some of the best breweries in the world. Some of the best breweries in the world now have their own breweries and used to work in macro lager facilities. Rare Barrel is a good example. I, I actually think a lot of people they don't when they don't when they cut out bigger breweries and whatnot, uh, they don't think about the brewers and stuff. I think a lot of the brewers who actually brew at bigger breweries are passionate about brewing. It's just the whole marketing thing mm. side of things, and they have their brand and whatnot. Uh, as you said, Rob Mitch Steele. He's brewing amazing beer at Stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a brewer at Budweiser for many, many he years. <laughs> and but the but the big thing Mitch always kind of like talks about with his experience at Budweiser, which is um, benefit of Stone consistency. Yeah. Everybody can chuck a load of hops in a beer, but you can't make it as long as you if you make it and bang on every time. Well, then you've got a brand. Uh, I, genu I, genu I genuinely mean it when I say that the best brewers in the world are ones who work for the biggest corporations because mm -hmm. they have to hit to, I mean, that they have no, no er margin of error. It has to be spot on time and time and time again, literally. Um, they can't, they can't have, think of every time you've had a lager and it tastes exactly the same as the last one you had. Yeah, that's because the brewers are the, they're that skilled. To be, uh, Budweiser is the best example. Four different types of beer blended in, they blend four different batches into one to produce the same equal consistently rubbish products, but it still tastes the same every time it's brewed. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's my that's my admission. I'm, I'm not saying I love it, but <laughs> they're skilled. They're very skilled. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But is it a different? Is it a different art? Is it a different? 
it, it is one a craft and is one the other one a, a an industrial process. You can be making I mean, a lot of times you can be making craft cheese slices. <laughs> you, you, you're maintaining the process. So much. You're overseeing and maintaining the process. Process right. because that's what you're doing. You're yeah. producing such an industrial state. You've got to produce enough for so many people. You've got to be so dead on. Yeah. So to the mark. One thing I find really interesting though is like um, how trends are coming back and shit. Uh, like the craft or the, the industrial stuff was so big for a long time. But what's coming back now with small independent brewers was what was before some of the craft stuff. It's kind of a weird cycle with also like in fashion and whatnot. Old yes. stuff, you know, start to come back. I, I think that's... I don't, it seems weird to say it like that about craft beer, but... Well, it's almost there is almost as if it's some old stuff are getting you know <coughs> older traditions are getting more in. I I don't know how to say it. But. What was that uh, film before Silence of the Lambs where everybody wore beards in the films and basically now everybody's wearing beards in the films because the fashion repeats itself. I have no clue what you were talking about, but it sounds cool. <laughs> You'll probably know, know later on, but in, in the, there was a, a, a sub, there was a film before Silence of the Lambs, and um, basically everybody had a beard in all the film. And now everybody's got a beard in all the film now. Like, everybody in if you look at the old uh, beer commercials, everybody's got a beard. The old beer commercials. <laughs> it produces a lot of, uh, this is what a man was supposed to look like. Beard. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, I think, I think Stu's trying to prove that he looks like a real man. He's got muscles. <laughs> I've got a beard. Ah. No, <laughs> out of, uh, to be honest, I think that's a perfect place to end on. Just yeah. the, the madness, flight of fancy that Mr. Shibiga comes out with. You, sometimes you can't, you can't top it. It's art, it's performance art. It's, it's beyond anything that we truly understand. Sure, pick up big and you to all you guys who, who've kind of tuned in and watched this tonight. Big thanks to Adam and 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 and, and Simon had to leave us a little bit earlier because the the British are lightweight smokers. <laughs> um, they got big, the big, big, Big big props to the hardcore, sticking it through until the bitter end. Really appreciate it, guys. It's always a lot of fun. Everybody who watches this live, great. Thank you very much. Everybody who watches the after show, appreciate that. <laughs> it's all about the love of beer, and that's why we, those guys are here. We'll see you next time. See you in another beer review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye.